Seated, I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that you shall answer unto God? I do. I'm seated. And the defense may examine the witness. Thank you, Judge. Sir, could you state your name for the record? Sure. It's Jonathan W. Priest. And I know you spell your first name a little different. Just tell me how you spell that. J O N A T H Y N. And Mr. Priest, could you tell us how you are employed or what is your occupation? Uh, I'm a partner with Bevel Gardner and Associates. I'm a forensic analyst and instructor for them. I've been doing that for, you know, since 2008. Okay. And as a forensic analyst, what does, what does that mean? What do you do? You know, basically I look at um, evidence, cases, circumstances, situations, uh, predominantly with crime scenes. Um, analyze those, uh, reconstruct those. And I believe you stated that's with Bevel Gardner and Associates? Yes. And where is that at? Uh, Bevel Gardner and Associates, the primary office is in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Okay. And could you tell me what your prior employment was that contributes to your uh, employment there at Bevel and Gardner? I was a police officer with the city and county in Denver in Colorado. Okay. And how long were you a police officer there? 32 years. And the highest uh, ranking position you had? I was uh, the lieutenant commander. Um, it, it, I actually ran the major crime section for the police department. Speaking of a forensic analyst, um, you also have training in crime scene reconstruction. Yes, sir. All right. And do you have any training in blood pattern analysis? Blood stain pattern analysis, yes, sir. All right. Can you tell us what education you've, you've had uh, in that field? Uh, blood stain pattern analysis? Yeah. Uh, I've got hundreds of hours of blood stain pattern analysis training that I began in the 80s, 1980s, while I was with the Denver Police Department in uh, training for analyzing blood stains, uh, which morphed into 
analyzing bloodstains in relationship to crime scenes and how it associates with crime scene reconstruction and analysis. Um, I've taught hundreds of hours and thousands of people in the areas of bloodstain pattern analysis in you know, probably 32 states and four countries. And, um, been doing that for quite some time. Okay. Can you tell me if you're involved in any professional organizations or have any memberships in any organizations in, in any of those fields? Uh, forensic analyst or crime scene reconstruction? Sure. Uh, I'm a member of the International Association for Identification, which is the IAI. The International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysts, which deals specifically with, with bloodstain patterns. Uh, the Association for Crime Scene Reconstruction, where I was also a board member, uh, the president and the, the chairman of the board for a number of years. Um, th those are the primary organizations that I belong to. All right. And how long have you been certified as a specialist in any of those fields? Uh, I'm certified in bloodstain pattern analysis through the IAI. Okay. Um, I got my certification back in 2011, maybe 2010. Right. And have you ever testified as an expert in state court or federal court in those fields? Many times. And have you, could you tell me some of the states, if any, that you have testified in? Yeah. California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. Colorado, Montana, Idaho, um, Wisconsin, um, Tennessee, uh, Virginia, Florida, uh, Georgia, uh, New York, New Jersey. Could you approximate how many times your testimony has been given as an expert in all of those schools? All oh, hundreds. And typically, what can you tell me if there's a percentage, uh, how often that you would testify for either the prosecution or the state of uh, any government or the feds? Mm. Overall, it's probably about 60 40 prosecution. Okay, 60% for prosecution. Yes. Okay. All right. And I'm going to show you what has been previously marked as. Defense Exhibit 51. I do. Okay, and what is that document? That is my curriculum to take. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, we would move to admit uh, Mr. Priest as an expert in the field of crime scene reconstruction and forensic analysis. And I have objections. No, I have to for I'm sorry. I'd like to a lot of bureaus of criminal investigation, a lot of folks engaged in crime scene analysis, they actually require a degree before you can get hired by them, correct? I, I know that there are, you're talking about law enforcement agencies? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm talking state, federal. I would say there are organizations, there are law enforcement entities that require a degree. Correct. Right. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the, the training uh, at the National Forensics Academy and some of those organizations are starting to require degrees as a prerequisite to attending or graduating their, their training. Isn't that correct? 
I wouldn't characterize it as a lot, but there are some. Okay. And the, the crux of your experience in this profession, the majority of your profession involvement, was actually was working for a city police department, correct? Correct. And that was the city of Denver, correct? Yes. You never worked for a state bureau of criminal investigation, right? Uh, well, what do you mean by worked for? Was I actually an employee of the organization? Correct. No, I, but I've done work for state organizations okay. in the areas of law enforcement and federal organizations. But you were not actually employed. I wasn't employed. Okay. Where that was your job 24-7. Right. Where you had to basically attend their continuing education and adhere uh, full time as an employee to their policies. That's fair. And you've never actually worked in a lab that's full time. Full time, no. And you're not a tool mark examiner, firearms examiner. You've never had that job full time, correct? Correct. And you've never been a full time like trace evidence examiner working correct. in a lab, correct? Correct. Um, The member organizations that you talk about, again, for the most part, as long as you are employed in this profession, uh, in good standing, you can apply to pay a fee and become a member of one of those organizations, that's correct? That's true. And you spend some time in there, and if you're active in that organization, then eventually you make your way and you can be president or something like that, correct? Sure. Next, we approach. Sir, are you aware, or have you been provided material regarding an eight-person homicide in Pike County, Ohio? Yes. And could you tell me what material you have uh, reviewed in, in regards to that case? Well, thousands of pages of written materials, photographs, video, okay. laboratory reports. Um, in regard to those photos or video or any of those, the scenes of uh, crime scenes? Yes. And did you review any uh, interviews? Yes. And who were those interviews of? Um, well, there were a number of individuals. Um, I'm really bad with recalling names. Uh, the one that I remember most prevalently is Jake Wagner. Okay, thank you. And. You were asked to prepare, you were asked to examine those crime scenes and prepare a report in regard to your findings or your opinion. Is that right? Yes. All right. I'm now going to provide you with the previous remark as it would have fit you to. Take a look at Exhibit 52, Defense 52, and tell me if you recognize that. Do. 
All right. And what is that document? Uh, that's a draft of my um, um, analysis report. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you questions about the report, that exhibit there that I just provided you. And feel free to look at that if you need in regard to any questions uh, that I'm about to ask. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you about is, are you familiar with uh, the scene, which we've called scene one, or the residence of Christopher Roden Sr.? Yes. All right. And uh, specifically, I would like to ask you about the decisions or opinions that you have regarding the movement of, well, did you observe blood at that scene? Yes. And uh, where was that blood at? Uh, mostly on the floor. Okay. Uh, there were some other objects that, that had what appeared to be blood stains on them, um, on the two bodies that were in the scene. Okay. And one of the specific questions that we asked of you was to determine um, how many people, if you could come to an opinion, how many people had perpetrated that offense or were present at that location. Do you recall that question? Yes. And were you able to arrive at an opinion regarding that? Yes. Okay, before we get to that, I'd like to redirect you back to that crime scene. Uh, what can you tell us about, and relying upon your training and experience and, um, and the blood uh, pattern analysis, what can you tell us about the, the blood that is on that floor? Let me find an exhibit. Sir, not leaving me what has been previously identified as State's Exhibit A221, A214, A213, A184, A181, and A168. Could you take a look at those? And tell me if you recognize those photos. seen those photos before? I have. All right. And can you identify, if you recall, where those photos are taken at what location? Uh, these are at the, what is being designated as the first scene, uh, okay. 4077. I believe that's the address. Yes. Um, I can't recall the street. Okay. And in regard to the blood there on the floor. What can you tell me about how that was deposited? What information does your training experience tell us about that? No, it's a volume stain, meaning that there's a, there's a, a lot of blood, uh, likely from a replenishing source, meaning that blood is continually added to the area from the blood source. Uh, there are what is primarily described as motion stains, which uh, in this particular setting, we have both wipes and swipes. Um, a wipe pattern is one where pre-existing blood has motion that goes through it. So say, for example, you have uh, paint on a floor, and you take your hand or a brush, and you just move through that, that liquid paint that creates a wipe pattern. Uh, a swipe pattern is where now we just have a brush with paint on it, and then we touch a non-bloody surface that creates what's known as a swipe. And that's basically what we're seeing here is we have this uh, blood, both pre-existing and existing, creating those wipe and swipe patterns. Those are the predominant stains that we see. Um, and then those, those have a primary category or a parent category of what's called a smear. And that's when I can't quite tell if it's a wipe or a swipe, so we're going to identify that as a smear. Okay. 
And can you tell me anything about how, in your training experience, how those smears uh, would have been left there in the floor? Well, again, it's, it's something that's moving through that blood. Uh, it can be an object that is moving through the pre-existing blood. It could be the blood source itself, the actual thing that has the blood on it. Uh, in this particular case, we know we have two bodies that are bleeding from open wounds. Those can easily be the source of creating these stains, and certainly the patterns that we see here are consistent with that. Okay, and in one of those photos, let me look at it, there is a, a circular pattern in the floor. I'm going to specifically direct you to two thirteen and two twenty one. I see a, a round stain, and it appears to be darker or a heavier accumulation. Can you tell me why that is? Uh, well, basically, we have a, a looped stain here. You can see where uh, there is a superior. Uh, drag that goes through or uh, uh, white that goes over the top of a pre-existing white. Uh, so that tells us that we have this circular looping motion. So we have a degree of sequencing with this particular area. Uh, a number of things can occur here. We can have a blood, uh, blood source that has moved through this area in the circular motion. We can have pre-existing blood here and then something else has moved through that plea pre-existing blood stain. Okay. And the order, tell me this, can we tell the order in which things would be on the floor in light of, say, a rug or a carpet? So I'm going to refer you to exhibits 214, 184, and 168. Uh, you could take a look at those. So I see the blood smears that you're talking about, but I see some other objects like a rug or a blanket carpet. I'm not sure what that is. Could you tell me how that is that carpet uh, does not have the blood on the top side, such as the floor? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Can you tell me whether those carpets were there or rugs were there? What role did they play with the smear in the floor? Well, the rugs got... It appears, because I don't have any photographs of the blood stains with the rugs removed. Right. So I really can't see under the rugs. However, looking at the, the wipes that we see here, it appears that they are beneath the rug, telling me that the wipes pre-existed the position of the rug. In addition to that, uh, the rug is turned over, there's a, some sort of transfer mark on the backing side of the rug, at least in one location, and it appears that there is saturation associated with that that doesn't have an identifiable source to it. So that rug was in a different position when blood was deposited on the rug, and then the rug appears to have been moved after the swipe was, um, or the wipe was created. Alright. And speaking of things that were moved or placed afterward, is there anything you can tell me about this recliner that is noted in A220? Yes. And what conclusion can be drawn from comparing the position of the recliner in the floor with the blood smear? Now there's the, there's a swipe stain. That I'm I'm going to back up and call it a smear uh, because I I can't see the area under the chair in this photograph that pre-existed the chair being placed in this location. So the chair's been moved after the blood stain was created. Okay. All right. Now I want to direct your attention to the actual injuries. Did you see photos or are you aware of? The bodies that were found in that residence. Yes. And can you tell me the injuries or the locations of the gunshot wounds? Um, well, but with one of the decedents, they were primarily to the head and face area. Okay. With another decedent, he also had head injuries, but he had a fairly egregious arm injury. 
All right. And you were able to determine, uh, based on your training experience, what likely caused that arm injury, is that right? Yes. And that would be what type of round or ammunition? Uh, the arm injury was likely created by a high-powered round knowledge that there was a um, SKS or in 7.62 by 3.9 caliber uh, that was present that easily could have created the injury to the arm. Okay. And I believe you noted in your report um, the, the type of ammunition or the type of firearms that were used at that residence. Do you recall? If not, I believe you've got it in your report. The types of firearms that were used here? Yes, at 4077 Union Road. Right, the, the two different calibers, the 7.62 by 3.9, which was associated with an SKS rifle, okay. and a 40 caliber uh, handgun right. uh, was the second. Okay, and if you recall from, I believe that you had told me that you had listened to a statement of Jake Wagner, is that right? Correct. All right. Did he ever get a description of the firearm, the 40 caliber? A, a make, a brand. Well, I know it was a Glock. Whether he actually said that or not, I can't say for certain. Okay, all right. And was there anything about the ammunition that was used, such as um, that you could determine from shell casings that were found at the scene? Well, the, the, the fired cartridge cases were Hornady brand. The projectiles that were covered are consistent with either um, the Hornady critical duty or the critical defense. Okay. They're basically the same ammunition, but the critical duty is loaded with a higher level of powder. Okay, and as far as the body, so we saw the blood smear. Uh, could you tell me where the bodies were found at 4770 Union Hill Road? Uh, they were in a bedroom um, okay. towards the back of the, uh, what I'm calling the back of the Right. And was there, how, if you recall, and I can find a photograph for you, do you recall the condition or whether the clothing, or how they appeared, I should say, in that room? Well, they appeared as if they'd been dragged by the feet. Okay. And did you have an order in which, in your opinion, that those bodies were placed in that room? Um, the uh, first body into the room was likely Gary. Um, uh, Roden, I believe, is the last name, and the second one was Chris. Okay, so I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit A447, States Exhibit A447. Could you take a look at that? Do you recognize that photo? I do. All right, and what would that photo be on? Uh, this is of the two decedents in the bedroom. Okay, and it appears that one or both are covered. What, what is that? Can you tell me? Uh, it looks like a bed comforter, like the top okay. cover of a bed. And based on your training and experience, what does that tell you when there's a cover? Well, it's not unusual in death scenes to see individuals who are covered up with some object. Uh, you see it a lot in efforts to hide or depersonalize a particular scene. Okay. All right. Now, I want to, we're going to come back to this, uh, but before I do, what type of residence is 4077? Uh, is this a house, a mobile home? It, it well, it, it, I imagine it could be made to be mobile, but it's primarily a, what appears to be a stationary residence. Okay, all right. And um, let me now move your attention to what has been called Crime Scene 3, this would be uh, the location of Dana Roden. Are you familiar with that residence? Again, recalling the names, um, is this the location with three decedents or two? Three. Three? Then you're saying. Okay. And do you recall who those three decedents were at that residence? Um, it, Dana was one, I believe another one was Chris Jr. Yeah. And I don't recall off the top of my head the name of the third individual. Okay. What can you tell me about the manner of death or uh, of those three individuals at that location? Gunshot wounds. All right. 
And when was the placement of those gunshot wounds? Where on the body? Primarily to the head and face area. Okay. And speaking of Dana, do you recall how she appeared or how the photographs that were provided to you, how they appeared on her body? You know, was she covered with anything? I know she had been moved some. Um, I, I'd have to look at the photos again to. Okay. I'm going to give you what has been previously marked as State Exhibit 298 and 299. Let me know if you recognize those photos. I do. All right. And. What can you tell me about those photos that I just provided you? Well, I have two photos. One, there is what appears to be a comforter over the top of the, the body. And the second one is with the comforter removed. Okay. All right. And in your report, did you provide an opinion regarding a pillow? Now, I, it, in that picture, it appears to be a pillow over top of Dana's face. Do you see that? I do. And can you tell me the location of that pillow, where it would have been prior to the shooting or after the shooting, the movement of that? Well, during bleeding, it had to be in a different position than what we see it in in the photograph. Okay. Um, there was blood staining on the pillow that can't get there with the blood in the position that we see it in in the photograph. So it had to be in a different position originally. And then it was moved from that position after blood staining got on the pillow and then uh, covered her face. Okay, and then I believe you identified a comforter or something that was placed over the body as well, is that right? Correct. And is that similar, consistent with what we saw at the first location with Christopher and Gary Brown? It is. All right, so, and I believe that you had testified that all of those gunshot wounds at that location were to the face or head area, is that right? At the one with the female in bed? Yes. yes. So I want to take your attention to, and we'll look for some photographs here, of crime scene two. This would be the residence of Frankie and Hannah Gilly. Do you recall those names? I do. While I'm looking for a picture here, do you recall where the shot location or shot placement was of those individuals, Gary, or Frankie and uh, Anna Gary? The, primarily the face and head. Okay. And in proximity to the eyes, can you tell me that on both? Uh, the female had a gunshot wound to the eye. The male had a gunshot wound, uh, I believe, just below the eye. Uh, I can't recall if it was left or right, but just below the eye. Let me show you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit B-167. Do you recognize that photo? I do. And does that contain the shot placement that you just testified to? Uh, it appears that it's uh, below the right eye. Okay. And while I'm looking for one of Anna Gilly, do you recall the shot placement on her? Uh, it was to the eye, but again, I don't recall. I, well, I think that one was to the right eye as well. Okay. All right. Um, now, let me take your attention to crime scene four. And show the picture. So the 
going to show you what has been previously marked as States Exhibit D-17. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that photo of? Uh, this is a residence. It's a fifth wheel trailer. This is where Kenneth Roden's uh, body was located. Okay. And I'm now going to show you what has been previously marked as States Exhibit D-191. Could you take a look at that photo? Yes. And what is that photo of? Uh, this is a photograph of Kenneth Roden in bed. Um, it shows a gunshot wound to the right eye uh, okay. and associated blood stains. And as far as those injuries, is there any consistency that you can tell me between the shots there and that Frankie and, and Hazel Hill? The, the gunshot wound on the body. The, the location yeah. is certainly consistent. Uh, with Kenneth, the muzzle of the firearm is significantly closer okay. than what I saw with the two at the other location, the male and the female had been. All right, and where were those, any similarities between where those individuals were actually shot, in the body or in the face? Uh, to a degree, I mean, to the eye. Okay, all right. Now, one of the questions that you were asked is whether it could be determined, and I want to focus primarily on 4077, that would be the first crime scene with uh, Chris Sr. and uh, Gary Rubin. Yes. The question that we had for you is whether or not you could determine, based on the evidence that you had there in front of you or that was provided, the number of perpetrators that would have been at that scene. And what was your response, or what, what is your opinion in regards to that question? Well, while I can't eliminate completely multiple offenders, uh, a single individual could have done everything that we see at that scene. Okay. Now, is there anything about, uh, when you looked at those blood smears that we went through in the floor at 4077, uh, anything about those blood smears on that floor that would indicate, that would provide clues as to whether there was one or more people there at that location? The biggest thing was the lack of multiple sole impressions, footprints, um, overlaying each other, movement in multiple directions. So, uh, that's one. Another one was the, the fact that you have a very narrow pathway between the living area through the kitchen and into the bedroom where things are not disturbed, they're not moved, turned over, uh, moved to a significant uh, degree, which tells me that it's limited individuals going through that area. Okay. And so I'm now going to show you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit A228. Could you take a look at that and tell us, and that's in regards to the testimony you just provided to us about uh, the spacing. What can you tell me and what does that photograph tell you? But basically, you have a, a chair, and it has a number of objects on it, a plastic bag, and then some what appears to be a pillow and a box and you know, something else on top of the box that are all kind of stacked in that area in this doorway with a drag trail that comes through it. Uh, really no great disturbance. There, the, uh, the plastic bag doesn't have any motion indicators where it's pulled around. The chair doesn't appear to be moved any significant distance. It appears to be consistent with the drag trail in the place that it is. Uh, there's just not a lot of okay. indications that, uh, again, it tends to support a single individual coming through this location. Okay, and just so we're all aware of what you're talking about, could you hold that photograph up for me so the jury can see what you're talking about in regard to the, the pathway? Okay. The pathway is this drag trail right here on the floor, uh, the blood pathway. Here's the chair, plastic bag, pillow, box, and some additional object that are stacked here. Uh, no indications that this has been moved any distance away from the drag trail. All right. And so, if I understand what you're telling me, is that whoever or however a body was dragged through there, I 
Uh, it is a leading question. It sounds like it started out that way, so I'm yeah. just thinking. All right. Um, let's see that Remember when we talked about you had looked at some previous photographs and the placement of furniture in a rug and you were able to determine, do you recall how you determined whether or not those objects were placed before or after the work scene? Well, yes. Okay. And how were you able to determine whether they were placed in before or after that blood smear was placed in? Well, the blood smear would have had to have been created first before the object got moved on top of it. Okay. Uh, and that's what the chair. Um, with the rug, the appearance is that the drag trail pre-existed the rug placement. Not having a photograph of that rug being moved, I can't exclude other possibilities, but it appears that the rug was placed there after the drag trail was created. Okay, so keeping that in mind, can you tell me on A228, there appears to be a chair there. Whether that chair was there at the time that blood smear went through. And looking at the, the chair leg and associated the associated with the chair, uh, there appears to be in this photograph uh, some swiping. Uh, material on the chair leg, which would certainly support that it was in this position when the blood source came through. Okay, and do you see any blood underneath the chair leg? No. All right. And so the absence of blood underneath the chair leg and then blood along the side of the chair leg would allow you to find what about the location of that chair as the body was put in there. Well, well, certainly that, and again, we're talking about the body. Uh, and that's consistent with the location of the bodies in the bedroom, but it's a volume blood source that's being dragged through here, certainly consistent with the body. All right, thank you. And so we, I started asking about these questions because the question dealt with the, uh, if you could determine the number of perpetrators or people in that scene. And in, in regard to the spatial area, what does this tell you? Well, again, it, it, there's limited spacing there. And it would be very difficult, well, it would be impossible to go through that location with two people side by side dragging an individual. You need to follow uh, an inline motion. So somebody would have to be uh, the, the indications with the bodies are that they were dragged by the feet. Um, the individual would have to be a single individual would have to hold on to the feet and drag them through there. Okay. I'm going to show you what has been previously marked as States Exhibit A169. And can you describe that photo? And Again, this is the, the living room area showing the volume of blood staining on the floor with the rug of the loop stain. Okay. With the volume of blood there, would you have an expectation or could you arrive at an opinion regarding the number of people that would be in that living room? Uh, based on this photograph alone? Yeah. Well, well, no, but there are things that I would expect to see Such as? if there were multiple people, and that would be additional footprints, overlaid footprints, a lot of activity back and forth type of thing, given the nature of the blood stains throughout the floor. Okay, all right. And knowing that at least a shoe contacted a wet blood source. Right, and when you say overlay of impressions with prints, what do you, what do you mean by that? Basically what we're creating is what's called a pattern transfer is you have a shoe sole that contacts a wet surface. Imagine an old hand stamp, and I know that some of us probably don't even remember what the heck I'm talking about with a hand stamp, uh, where the, it contacts ink and then it makes repeated impressions, pattern impressions. A shoe works basically the same way. It contacts this wet blood source, and then as it contacts 
uh, non-bloody surfaces, it begins to leave repetitive pattern transfers on those areas that diminish over time because the blood is drying and the blood is worn away and you have several prints that are left behind as it goes along. Um, overlays is when that same or similar objects are creating these patterns, they tend to go on top of something that pre-exists in there as well. I'm not seeing any of that here. And speaking of prints, can you tell me the direction or if there's a direction that can be indicated? Well, first of all, can you tell me whether any prints were found in the blood there in that room or in the living room kitchen area of 4077? They were. All right. And were they, were those prints, um, in different directions? In other words, was the toe of those prints say in different directions or did they indicate a common direction of travel? The, the, well, the prints that I saw uh, indicate a direction of travel from the bedroom out to the living room. Okay, all right. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to States Exhibit D25. Take a look at that photograph for me and tell me if you recognize that. The photograph, yeah. Okay, and what is that photograph of? Uh, again, it's a photograph of the Fifth Wheel Residence for Kenneth Roden, and it shows a blue Dodge pickup truck uh, that's parked uh, near the Fifth Wheel. Okay. And so, you, again, you have reviewed the statement of Jake Wagner, is that right? Yes. All right. And do you recall his explanation of how Kenneth was killed in that fifth wheel camper? Your Honor, he objects to that. That's not So you're going to withdraw that question and ask another one? I will, Your Honor. All right. Do you still have that photograph? Okay, D25. I have a question for you, uh, a hypothetical. If it's dark outside and you are positioned behind that blue dodge, would you be able to see a gun flash inside of that fifth wheel camper? In my experience, I wouldn't say so. Now, with the presence of... Uh, in my experience, I would not say so. Thank you. Now, with the existence of a light source inside of that fifth wheel camper, make it more, less likely, or have no effect at all on observing a gun flash from the outside? Well, any addition of, uh, of light to that location would mute any particular created flash if one actually occurred. Okay. And we have, well, do you recall specifically being asked about a uh, gun flash and about how much flash there is with a gunshot? Do you recall that? I do. All right. Uh, and did you conduct an experiment or demonstration of, of the amount of flash? Yes. 
I'm going to show you a recording, if you could. While we're waiting on this video to play, is this a video that you created? It is. I, you, there are several, but yes. Okay. Can you tell me the type of ammunition and firearm that you used? The firearm was a Glock 40 caliber pistol. Okay. Uh, the ammunition was Hornaday critical duty ammunition. Oh. Okay. So, uh, you request play? Yeah, go ahead. If you could, look over to, over your shoulder. Right, right. Oh, you've got it there. Yeah. Now, the gun that we just saw in that video is, what type of gun again? That's a 40 caliber Glock. And the ammunition is? Hornaday um, Critical Duty. Okay. And the demonstration, the point of this video was to tell us uh, see if we could visualize a flash from the muzzle of the fire. Okay. Do you recall the time of day that that video was taken? Um, approximate morning? It was just after sundown. It was about uh, seven-ish in the evening. Okay. Did you make more than one video? Several, yes. All right. So I'm going to play the next one for you. <laughs> And could you tell me what is the difference between this video now that we're looking at and the first? Uh, the, well, the first one was taken right as the, at dusk, where the sun had just cleared the horizon. Uh, the, now it's just getting darker and darker um, at this same location. Okay. Now, did you notice a flash in that video? I do. All right. And was this the same type gun and ammunition used in the first? Everything's the same. All right. If we could, let's go to the very last one. Oh, that one. So let's, let's make a record. If you could watch the video that's there in front of you now, on this video, can you see it? Can you, there, there's an object that's on the monitor now. Can you tell me what that is? It's my phone, and it just shows various time zones uh, from different areas of the country, uh, including Denver, which is the area where I did this. Okay. Could you <coughs> just one second? Do you need me to rewind that, or can you tell me what time it was? at the time that this video here was made? It was after 8 in the evening. Um, I, I don't, I, I would have seen it on the phone, but I didn't look that okay. close. Now, we're replaying, this is going to be the last video. Do you see the time? Uh, it's 8.30 p.m. in Denver. Okay, all right. Which would be 10.30 here. Okay. Now, did you observe flash in that video? I did. All right. So, in the hypothetical that I gave you, if you were referring to States Exhibit D-225, if 
you're in the night hours, such on the video that we just played, and behind that blue dodge, what is the likelihood that you would see a flash from a gun discharge inside that trailer? Not likely at all. Okay. And would that matter if the door was, the front door here is open or closed? No. Right. And did you notice, let me show you what has been marked, States Exhibit 213, D213, if you could take a look at that. And that, you know, could you describe what that is in that photo? Uh, it's a window with Venetian blinds pulled over the top. It looks like the blue pickup truck that we saw in the previous photograph is in the background looking out of the window okay. um, when the blinds are spread open. All right. And so now I'm going to show you what's been labeled as State's Exhibit D-213. Tell me if you recognize those blinds. I do. And so those blinds are over a window, right? They are. All right. And in relation to the body, where are they? Oh, we're, they're basically at the foot of the body or off. Well, <clears throat> they would be to the left side of the body. Okay. All right. But those blinds appear to be open or closed? Closed. All right. And how would that affect your ability to see gun flash from within that fifth wheel camera? Uh, well, it would baffle it even further. I mean, it, it, like I said, it'd be, it, I wouldn't think you could see the flash from outside anyway, based on my experience. Uh, the blinds mute that even further. Okay, all right. And in uh, addition, when you look at this photograph, there's a, a light that is on in this area, which is gonna provide additional ambient lighting, which is even gonna further mute any right. flash that may have been created. So based on your training and experience, the likelihood of seeing a gun flash from outside of that fifth wheel camper is what? I, I wouldn't think you're gonna see one, again, based on my experience. All right. In regard to, and this is gonna be comparison with uh, the other scenes, is there anything about the injuries or anything about the bodies that tell you that this is a a common gun man or a common person shooting each person? <clears throat> well, the, the fact that, with the exception of the, the first scene where two different calibers are used, uh, the caliber of firearm that is used in the other scenes is relatively monogamous, yeah, it, it, the same. You have 22 calibers used at the middle two scenes, and you have a 40 caliber used at the last scene. Okay. All right. Anything about the location of gunshot wounds or anything about the bodies and how they're positioned or placed that would give you any indication um, how many uh, perpetrators? Uh, again, with the, the first scene, you have individuals that uh, were dragged into a bedroom, were likely up and uh, aware when the shootings occurred. Uh, all the other scenes, the individuals who were shot are in bed. Um, little to any movement associated with those individuals. Um, uh, one individual easily could have done all those shots. Okay. All right. Now, all of these opinions that you've given here today, are they based on a, excuse me, to a degree of um, reliable scientific certainty? I'd say reasonable technical certainty. Okay. All right. Hold on one
Okay. Is that consistent with the testimony you provided here? Yes. And is this report the final or not? Uh, well, it's a draft. I mean, this, this particular document likely has some grammar and okay. typo issues. But have you, have you uh, prepared yes. another report after? This, this is the only report I've pre prepared in relation to this case. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, statement cross exam. John, the only issue that I have is going to take me probably about ten minutes. It's going to take me a few minutes to reset. I got to move all that stuff. I got to move the exhibits that I'm going to be scanning. So I don't know if we want to keep the jury seating here while I do that. I'd, I'd probably prefer to take a little bit of break instead of having to sit here. It's 10 after 10, uh, so 15 minute break would make it 25 after. We'll take a, we'll take a 15 minute break, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. Uh, while you're on break, do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit this case to be discussed with you or in your presence. Do not form or express an opinion concerning the case. Uh, do no research at all concerning the case as to the facts or as to the law from any source at all. Do not view, read, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all and have no contact with participants in the case, including parties, counsel, or witnesses. At the end, at 25 um, after you are to assemble at the jury room, you'll be brought up uh, by court personnel from there. Does counsel for either side have anything before we recess for 15 minutes? No, no, thank you. Then we are in recess until 25 after.
You may be seated. I believe that uh, defense counsel wishes to identify some uh, of the videos for the jury. And so, John, the first video, just for the record, the first video that we watched is a digital file at 559A893. Uh, Mike, would you may now cross-examine the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Priest. How are you? Good. Uh, excellent. Hey, listen, you, one of the things you do as, as a consultant or part of your job is you teach law enforcement across the country, correct? Yes. Okay. And you teach on a bunch of different subjects, correct? Yes. Right. One of the topics you teach on is officer-involved critical incidents. Is that correct? Correct. Right. And part of the teaching involved in that is... Uh, the physiological or psychological effect that somebody suffers or may experience when they're going through a critical incident or a traumatic incident. Is that correct, right? Yes. Right. I'm going to hand you a document. I don't want you to read it off, right? I'm just going to have you take a look at it. It's not marked. I just want to see. Are you familiar with that, that PowerPoint? Uh, yes. Okay. And that's a PowerPoint of some of the teaching or some of the topics you cover uh, with respect to critical incidents. Correct. Right. Right. Now, surely teaching in this area, are you familiar with Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman? Yes. Okay. And again, he's an expert on, a nationally recognized expert on critical incidents or, again, the psychology of killing, shooting, combat, and the effects of that may have on a person, correct? Correct. Right. As a matter of fact, a lot of your teaching um, and a lot of the stuff you do kind of mirrors the, the, the stuff that he does as well, correct? There's likely some similarities, yes. All right. You guys rely on the same research. There's, there's some pretty good studies out there on uh, some of these issues, correct? True. All right. National Institute of Justice has done some studies on the effects that people may experience when they are um, when they shoot somebody or involved in a shooting correct yes all right and i want to talk to you uh, about some of that can you tell the jury what is auditory exclusion auditory exclusion basically is your ears can't turn off but auditory exclusion is when you are not paying attention to what might what sounds might be coming into your ears um, other stimulus, visual stimulus, physical stimulus, may interrupt what the ears are actually hearing. So although the ear actually is hearing something, the, the brain is not perceiving it. And if you don't perceive something, you can't recall it, meaning that th there may be noises around, but because you don't perceive them, you can't tell somebody, oh, by the way, I heard this. That's basically auditory exclusion. Excellent. And again, that is fairly common in shooting incidents. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. That's very common. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the research that you use when you teach shows that around 85% of people who were involved in shooting, either shooting at somebody, shooting somebody, actually experience some level of auditory exclusion. Is that correct? That's fair. And again, based on that research and based on what you teach, uh, it, it's pretty unreliable to count on a person involved in a shooting to accurately recount the number of shots that they shot, correct? Mm, yes, very much so. Okay. And it's actually pretty unreliable, based on the research and your teachings, uh, for a person who's involved in a shooting where there's other people as well, to accurately recount the number of shots they heard from the other person as well, correct? Sure. All right. As a matter of fact, the research actually shows that the more shots you shoot, the less accurate your recall is on the number of shots you shoot. That's correct, right? That's probably fair, yes. All right. And again, 
the ability of somebody at a scene who's involved in a stressful shooting or shooting somebody else, uh, again, it, it's notoriously unreliable to count on that person to recall accurately the number of shots that they took, correct? I'd agree with that. All right. Can you tell the jury what tunnel vision is? Tunnel? There are two different areas of the eye. You've got, you've got focal length and then you've got peripheral length. Focal length is about a two to three degree area that our eyes actually focus on. Our peripheral vision is about 120-ish degree angle out to the side to where we can see other things that are out there, but we can't necessarily identify them. Tunnel vision is where you're in a stressful situation or some stimulus is involved to where you're paying most attention to that two to three degree focal length angle. So all that other peripheral vision is actually disappearing and we're not recalling it. And it falls into an area called saccades, which are things that you just can't recall. So you're really only paying attention to that very small focal length area and in effect, you're creating a tunnel vision of what it is you're actually looking at. And all those other things around you disappear. And in the profession, it's it's sometimes, I don't know if anecdotally is the right word, but it's sometimes it's referred to as like looking through the toilet paper tube, right? Well, that's a fair analogy, but I mean, you, you're still seeing it, you're just not recalling it. A absolutely. And again, under normal situations, typically we're able to recall what we're seeing out of our peripheral vision. It's the stress of these shootings that triggers a lot of times the tunnel vision. Is that correct? Correct. And as a matter of fact, the research shows that about 80% of the people who were involved in a shooting, either shooting somebody or shooting at somebody, uh, experience some kind of tunnel vision, or report experiencing tunnel vision, correct? Well, in many stressful situations, but shooting is one of them. Okay. Yes. Can you tell the jury what time distortion is? Time distortion is where you basically lose your sense of how quickly or how slowly something is going. You may actually have a sense in, well, it's like sitting on a hot stove. Okay, it seems that while you're actually there, it might be milliseconds, but it feels like forever because of the, the pain that is associated with it. So there's a time distortion. Something may happen very, very quickly, but your sense is, is that it really took a long time for it to actually occur, that typical time distortion. And it, it can happen both ways, right? Time can speed up and time can slow down. It can do both, and it can happen with the same individual even at the same location. Right, and because of that, uh, because of these trauma-based distortions, the ability of a person who's in a stressful or traumatic uh, event, or who's involved in shooting somebody, or shooting at somebody, um, again, it's not uncommon for that person to not be able to accurately recall the amount of time that the traumatic event actually occurred, correct? I'd agree with that. That's fairly common, correct? It's common, yes. Yeah. And again, because of these, these are known as perception distortions, correct? Correct. Because of these perception distortions related to trauma, uh, objective evidence, and you teach this, right? Objective evidence that's found at the scene, a lot of times actually tells the story better than the human testimony related to it. Agreed. Now, again, you would agree that Differences in, in the human testimony with respect to specific uh, evidence that is seen, um, it doesn't necessarily mean a person's lying, right? That's correct. Okay. And a, a lot of times it's actually linked to these stress-induced perception distortions, correct? Uh, again, if you don't perceive it, you can't report it. As part of your work in this case, you actually, again, as you testified to, um, did some analysis of the evidence from the various scenes, correct? Yes. And you would agree that, again, it's important to focus on what that evidence is telling you. Again, the, the evidence from the scene can tell you a pretty good story about what happened, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, one of the things that you did in this case is you looked at the trajectory with respect to the rifle rounds that were fired from outside into the, the scene number one, 4077, correct? Yes. Right. Give me some TV. And Mr. Jeff, we're going to go into the, there should be a four in that file that's called Barrett Chance. You need to find that one. 
I'm going to put up for you and for the jury what's been marked as identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-544. First of all, show it to you. Okay. Do you recognize that scene? I do. Okay, and what do you recognize it as? Uh, that's the 47, 4077 address. Okay. Otherwise known as scene one, correct? Right? Yes. And again, as part of your work, you look at uh, a trajectory analysis or the trajectory analysis with respect to the shots that were fired into the front of that residence. Is that correct? Correct. Now, is that, is that your point or is that our point? Must be yours. Okay. I, I thought I saw you carry a pointer, but can I have oh, that? Sure. Thanks. Appreciate it. Now, you understand uh, in this case that that trajectory analysis was done with a Ferro scanner. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, again, you've been doing this for a long time, correct? Yes. And when you first started, they didn't have Ferro scanners, did they? Didn't have them. You did your trajectory analysis back in the good old days with string and rods and trigonometry, correct? Uh, mostly rods and trigonometry, but strings for demonstrative purposes. Okay. And again, it's good, uh, it's good when you're doing this type of analysis to use visual aids so that, again, eventually a jury can see where a round came from. You would agree with that, correct? Yes. And back in the day, you used a string for that, correct? Uh, well, and lasers. Okay. Are you familiar with the Ferro scanners? Yes. And again, you would agree that uh, those Ferro scanners use laser, laser measurements as they're, as they're mapping a scene, correct? Correct. And I, I, the testimony, I think, was in a, in a normal scan, they use up to 40 million, or they do about 40 million laser shots to, to document a, a scheme, the, the scene that they're scanning. Would that, does that sound about right? Yeah. Well, they create a point cloud, which is laser dots that are going over, and it actually creates a a visual representation of the scene through right. laser scanning or point cloud creation. Correct. And again, although the Ferro scanner can be used for trajectory analysis and creating flyovers or visual aids for, for court, the primary focus is to actually map and measure a, a crime scene, correct? Yes. Okay. And again, they're, they're accurate. They're, they're accurate, yes. Okay. Now, you had the opportunity, again, as part of your work in this case, to review the Ferro scan that was used with respect to the trajectory analysis in this case, correct? Yes. Right. Rob, just give me um, that first one from side, no cones. I'll figure out what it is. All right, I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit S1C. And again, you have it there in front of you. S1C that I handed you, handed you, is that the same image that you have in front of you? Uh, this is more cropped, but yes. Okay. Uh, and again, is that uh, the type of image that you used when you looked at your trajectory analysis in this case? Yes. All right. Go ahead and give me another one. Some junk. Over here, the good thing? Sure, that'll work. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit S1B. State's Exhibit S1B. Again, can you look at that? Do you recognize that as a Ferro scan that was done with respect to the trajectory analysis in this case? Yes. And then finally, go ahead and give me that last one, Mr. Jump. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit S1A. State's Exhibit S1A. Again, same question. Do you recognize that as... Uh, a Ferro scan that was done with respect to the analysis in this case. Yes. Right. And are those the, the types of scans and the type of information that you used to basically verify or check the trajectory analysis that was done in this case? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. And you actually, as part of your work in this case, you agreed with BCI with respect to their findings of the trajectory, correct? Yes. Okay. And if you want to refer to your report, your report's right there, page 38 of your report. You made the finding that the digital trajectory analysis supports that the 7.62 by 39 rifle was discharged from outside the residence and loaded to the ground, correct? Correct. Right. 
You were also asked, as part of your work in this case, to do some analysis with respect to where Chris Roden was when he was shot with that high-powered rifle. That's part of your analysis in this case as well, correct? Yes. All right. And did you do that? I did. Mr. Priest, when I'm looking at this, remind me, I put it right here. All right. I'm going to put that pointer up there. All right. Before we go there, actually, I want to, based on your analysis of the trajectory of those rounds, would you agree, again, that those rounds were fired close to the ground somewhere in this bare patch on State's Exhibit A, 544? Well, certainly the trajectory is pulled to that location, and yes, a shot could be made from that, but actually the firearm can be anywhere along those trajectory lines. Oh, that's a great point. That's a great point. So ultimately, the way trajectory works is it comes out at an angle, and eventually it would run into the ground, correct? Correct. So that would signify that that gun or the rifle was at ground level, correct? If that's where it originated, and then if there was other evidence that would support its position there, but if somebody were to say, could it have been fired from there? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But you would agree also, and again, this is the fairness of your analysis, it could be fired anywhere along that track between the origination point and the front of the trailer, correct? Well, to a point. There are defects that are not denoted with the trajectory lines here that are on that table, or what I'm calling a table, where there was wood flooring or wood planking that was also struck. So the muzzle has to be this side of that. Correct. Great point. So it's got to be this side of it in that yard in front of those wood planks. And along that trajectory. And along that trajectory, correct. So again, actually, those wood plankings, or those floor plankings, I guess, were part of your analysis that you used with respect to where Chris Senior was. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put up for you and for the jury what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A-546. State's Exhibit A-546. If you could, just take a second to familiarize yourself with that. In the evidence that you reviewed, did you have a copy of this overhead diagram? What I'm looking at here? Right. Yes. Okay. So you're familiar with that piece of, obviously not blown up, but you're familiar with that piece of evidence. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So again, one of the things you were asked to do is to look at the positioning of Chris Senior at the front of this trailer and draw an opinion with respect to where he was and how he was shot, basically. Is that correct? Yes. And in rendering that opinion, your opinion is that Chris Senior was shot with a high-powered rifle. Is that correct? He has injuries that would certainly support that. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit E-20 and E-21. I'm not going to publish this. I'm sorry. E-20 and E-21. Do you tell the jury what we're looking at there in E-20 and E-21? Well, it's basically an egregious injury to the arm. They have a lot of radiating tears, some everted muscle and skin, pushed out muscle and skin coming from the arm. Okay. Based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, that injury is consistent with a high-powered rifle. It certainly supports that. Your Honor, I'm going to publish these for the jury. Not overhead, but I'm going to walk them in front of the jury. They've been previously identified by Judge Schultz. Okay.
And you would agree, you, you say you use the word egregious. That's a pretty massive injury, correct? Yes. Nearly severed that arm, correct? No, no, but it created quite a wound. Right. Clearly impacts arteries, veins, flesh, bone. Likely, yes. I, 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 certainly bone, certainly muscle and tissue, um, arteries, and, without looking at the wound itself, I couldn't tell you what arteries may or may not have been compromised. You would agree that that's the type of injury that certainly would bleed? Oh, absolutely. Profusely, correct? It, it can, and I go back to the blood stains in the case. Again, that's why I'm hesitant to say that I have a compromised artery. With a pressurized blood system, the artery typically is going to pulsate. Every time the heart beats, it's going to pressurize that system. It's going to push blood out like water from a hose. And I'm not seeing any of that kind of staining in the scene. So I'm hesitant to say that we, I have a breached artery here, at least one that is open for exposure to the, the scene. Okay. But once, again, inside this scene, once we get inside this scene, there are, there are massive, ma I wouldn't say pools, but there's massive amounts of blood on the floor here that eventually gets swiped or, or wiped, is that correct? Right, no, I would agree with that. Yeah. And I'm not saying this wound wouldn't have bled, it likely bled a lot. Right. But did it have a breached artery pulsating right. to, uh, defect to it? Right. I can't tell you that it did because that evidence isn't here. And I didn't ask you if it was pulsating, I just asked you if this type of wound that would bleed a lot. It would bleed a lot. I just wanted to clear up that artery thing. Okay. And one of the other injuries that you looked at was stippling to Mr. Rhodes' head. Is that correct? Yeah, pseudo stippling. Pseudo stippling. That's right. And specifically, it's wood chips in this case, correct? Or yes. Wood splinters. Yes. I'll show you what's been marked for identification purposes. States Exhibit E9. Can you take a look at that for me? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury what, what that is? It's pseudo stippling. And this exhibit, say exhibit E9, actually depicts those wood splinters in his forehead, correct? Right? You can see them, and that's consistent with wood splinters. Yeah, I'm going to publish this as well. Okay, with respect to those splinters, clearly those splinters have to be fairly solid to embed into his head, right? That's not, that's not cardboard, that's not cork board, those are, those are wood splinters, correct? Right? Mm, uh, I would agree that they're consistent, and uh, a pathologist is going to pull those out and likely analyze them. Okay. I didn't see a specific report for that, but uh, given the, the scene context, I don't have a problem with saying those are wood splinters. Okay. And again, in order to get those splinters in the forehead like that, Chris's head would have had to been in proximity to a piece of wood that's splintered, correct? Well, it certainly have to be in that that uh, that cone of, of debris. Right. Yes. And again, in order to embed and create pseudo stippling. You're going to have to be pretty close to that, correct? Depending on the amount of kinetic energy that's involved, but certainly he's not inside the house. He's going to have to be near that shattered wood that's out there. Okay. So when he got those, it's your opinion that he was not inside the house when he got those? those. Oh, no. He's, he's on the porch when that happens. Okay. And you based your opinion, well, there was one other in injury as well that you found to be consistent with a high-powered rifle, right? And that was a perforating defect of the body. Defect of the body. And that's a defect of the body, we're talking about a, a bullet wound, in is the front of the stomach that comes out the face of the back. Yes. All right. And again, that's the type of injury that clearly would bleed, correct? Now, it could bleed internally. Agreed. All right. But it also could bleed externally. Could, given the location of it, you might have some bleeding. Most of the bleeding is going to be internal in that type of wound, but sooner or later it's going to escape. And is it also common, 
uh, for when a bolt passes through a, a body like that, for that bolt, the, the energy and the round itself to pull out flesh, blood, and other material as it exits out. It can. Now, you, in rendering your opinion that he was outside, there were really two things that, that, that you, you looked at. Or well, there was a couple things you looked at. Um, wood, those wood splinters were, were part of it. And I'm going to show you um, some entrance holes to the outside of the, the trailer here in a second. But your understanding, you, you, would, you would agree with me that when you're making assumptions about evidence, it's important to base your ultimate opinion on what the evidence shows, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. So in this case, actually, you were making some, assum uh, some assumptions when you were looking at Chris's position, you were making some assumptions based on information other than the evidence itself, correct? Let me, let me rephrase it. Yeah. You looked at, you looked at Jake's table, correct? Well, it was one of the things that I looked at, certainly. Let me back up. Let me, let me back up. I'm going to back you up. Page 38 of your report, you issued the opinion that the 7.62 by 39 wounds associated with Mr. Roden Sr. are consistent with occurring while he was outside that residence. And as a matter of fact, you just testified that that 7.62 shot actually happened while he was out that residence, correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. Junk. Can you give me State's Exhibit A146? My hand was going to mark for identification purposes. Actually, here it is. State's Exhibit A146, and again, A146, you got it on the computer there. Mm -hmm. It's up for the jury as well. The wood, or the flooring, that you're talking about that you believe left this pseudo stippling in Mr. Roden's head, is that flooring depicting that picture. It is. Okay. And can you, I've got the pointer. Can you point to it? Can you point to it? Up there and show us where it is. This area here on the planks. Okay. And again, based on your review of the evidence in this case, there was actually an underlying projectile that was found in those those flooring planks, is that correct? Yes, the, the planks actually give an indication that it's struck by more than one round. Okay. Uh, but at least one of those those projectiles maintained its position in the, the floor. And again, that's evidence item number 15 up on that board, is that correct? It appears so, yes. Can you give me State's Exhibit A-157. I'm going to show you that State's Exhibit A-157 as well. Can you take a look at that? And again, State's Exhibit A-157, that's just another picture of where those bullet strikes are. Is that correct? Correct. And again, based on your opinion and your review of this case, Mr. Roden would have had been standing somewhere back in here, correct? Well, between the wood planks and those defects to the, the door frame. Correct. Correct. 
And I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes of Safety Exhibit A-158. If you take a look at Safety Exhibit A-158 for me. And again, that, the defect that you're talking about, when specifically in your report, you link the stippling, the pseudo stippling in his head to ballistic event 1.0. Say that again. In your report, you say that the pseudo stippling that we saw in that picture of Mr. Roden's head is linked to ballistic incident or ballistic events 1.0. Well, it's certainly consistent with what we're seeing here. Can you go to page 38 of your report? Paragraph 3. Pseudo stippling observed to the face and forehead of Mr. Roden appears to link the projectile interaction with the wood surfaces ballistic event 1.0 struck by projectiles outside the residence. That's your finding, correct? It appears to, yes. Okay. And again, you. Mr. John, this is one where I actually want you to zoom in a little bit. Stop right there. I want you to look at that zoomed in. You would agree with me that's not real wood, correct? Well, sometimes you have laminates that are associated with it, laminate having a wood characteristic to it, but the underlying base is certainly some sort of composite. Okay. And clearly it has a texture that, again, is, is a composite that's not straight wood splinters. You would agree with that, correct? I'd agree with that. Mr. Jump, can you back me out of there real quick? And can you give me State's Exhibit A-159? I'm going to put a State's Exhibit A-159 up on the board. The second thing that your opinion is based on with respect to the fact that Mr. Rhodes was shot, shot outside on that, that porch is that ballistic event two and three. And can you zoom in on those for me, Mr. John? Stop right there. Do you see ballistic event two and three there? Yes. Again, explain to the jury what they're seeing with respect to those two uh, ballistic events as compared to five and four. With two and three, the bullets appear to be destabilized in that they're no longer ballistically efficient. Uh, so they're wobbling, have some nutation or d d tumbling. And with respect to your opinion in this case, you related that to the, the possibility that those bullets actually went through Mr. Roden's body, causing the arm injury or the, the perforating injury to the stomach, correct? Could. Okay. Uh, but there are other things that could cause that bullet to tumble or, or cause that atypical bullet strike, correct? Sure. Intermediate target interaction. The, okay. the, the wood planks. Wood planks, any other object on that deck, correct? But piece of paper. A silencer. I'm sorry? What about a, an oil filter attached to the end? What if a round had to punch through an oil filter? As it oh, absolutely. Okay. Can you back that up just a little bit for me? You would agree that there is no blood spatter or any type of cast off anywhere on that wall. You would agree with that, correct? I agree with that. And you would agree, I'm going to put up a good mark of identification purposes, State's Exhibit A545. Take a second look at that. And this has been marked as the overhead related to biological evidence that was collected from that scene. 
You've seen that as well, correct? I have. And you would agree that there was absolutely zero blood smears, blood spatter, blood droplets, blood collected anywhere or found anywhere in this area of the porch. You would agree with that, correct? I would. Based on your observations of the injury to Mr. Roden, the pseudo sibling wood in his head, and the atypical marks of the bullets, kind of right in his front wall there, those, those ballistic events two and three, it was your opinion that he was shot on this porch and then fell into the house. Is that correct? Well, we would have had to enter the home at some point, yes. Right. I'm going to direct you to page 38 again. Go down to paragraph 5. Okay. And again, that's your opinion that he was shot outside and then ultimately fell into the house, correct? Well, again, in paragraph 5 doesn't say anything about falling. It just says that the descriptions of Jake Wagner are consistent with what I'm seeing at the scene. Okay. I'm going to take you to page 21 of your report. First line at the top, again, I don't want you to read it out loud, but again, you're saying that it was consistent with him making a sound and falling into the house, correct? Well, this was a statement of Mr. Wagner. Which you found to be consistent, correct? With your findings. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not adopting his words. I'm simply saying that the evidence is consistent and supports me. Okay. So let's look at that front porch area a little bit. I'm going to stay with this picture. Are we back out of the way? I want to direct your attention to ballistic event six on that door. Can you see that? Mr. Rob, can you jump in here? Zoom in. You see that as well, correct? Yes. Okay. And again, you recognize that to be another projectile strike or bullet entry into that residence, correct? It has consistency of that, yes. Mr. Jones, can you back out and can you give me State's Exhibit A-272? If you will, direct your attention to the right of that door. You would agree that hinges are on the right of that door, correct? Yes. And you would agree that based on the location and nature of those hinges, that screen door appears to open out, correct? Yes. You also would agree that that screen door has no handle on it, correct? Handle? Handle. I don't see a handle on it. Okay. 
Mr. Junk, can you zoom in again to that those events? All right, back. Okay, you can see ballistic event number six there, correct? Yes. And again, you would agree that that is on the outside of that door, correct? Correct. All right. Back now just a little bit, Mr. Junk. And then once again, you would agree that there's absolutely no smears, no cast off, no spatter, or no transfer of blood in the area of that door handle of that area, correct? I don't, but I wouldn't really expect any. You got a guy who's on this front porch who's been shot with an egregious, those are your words, right? Yes. Egregious injury that yes. clearly be bleeding. You got him through and through the gut, and somehow he gets through that door into the living room without leaving a smudge or a smear? Yes. And those are your findings, right? Yes. And that's your opinion that he was absolutely outside, correct? The evidence supports that he was outside on the porch when he was struck, yes. So let's, let's go inside that door, Mr. Chunk. Can you give me A274? And if you could, well, let me orient you, Mr. Priest. Now we're inside that screen door, all right? And you see to the right, do you see the wood frame there? I do. Okay. Mr. Chunk, can you zoom in a little bit on that ballistic event that's down there? Do you, do you recognize or do you see ballistic event 6.1? Yes. And that's on that door, the inside of that door, correct? Yes. And again, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, the way these ballistic events are marked is the entrance is given one number, and if it's shown to be associated, it's given like a 6.1 or some kind of number that associates that inside uh, event with the outside event, correct? Yes. So, again, the one on the outside of that door is 6.0, and the one on the inside is 6.1. Yes. And you surely would have to agree that that is indicative of that door being shut at the time that those bullets came through, correct? I'd agree with that. And again, I don't want to take you back, but that, that shot group that we saw on the outside of that door uh, with, those, uh, with those holes, again, those, those are all, they all seem to be associated with the same type of shot group. Is that correct? The same shot group? They all appear related. Okay. Ms. Junk, can you give me State's Exhibit 304? All right, I'm going to orient you a little bit more. Now we're just going down that wooden door frame a little bit. You recognize that area? I do. Okay, and again, do you see ballistic event 5.1, ballistic event 4.1, and ballistic event 3.1? I do. And again, you would agree that those are associated with ballistic events 5, 4, and 3 on the outside of the trailer, correct? Agreed. Mr. John, can you zoom into that a little bit for me? You would also agree that there's flesh, fresh splintering in that door frame consistent with projectiles passing through, correct? Agreed. And you would agree that, again, the splinters in that wood, which is wood, are actually peeled out like they're flying inside the house. You would agree with that, correct? Yep. All right. Mr. John, can you back that out a little bit? Actually, can you go back to that last picture, 274, A274? Okay. Just leave it right there. Again, you would also agree that, can you see projectiles correct 6.1 and then the top of the 5.1 there? Yes. You would also agree that if an average size man was standing in front of that door, that would be consistent with being about midline, abdomen, midline, right arm, if my arm was 
hanging or down on the side. Oh, I suppose you could align those, yeah. Okay. Ms. Junk, can you give me 305? Again, same, same area. You would agree that's consistent with splintering and wood coming through there, correct? You could have wood splintering associated with that, yes. Three or six. I'll just keep going. Again, that shows 3.1. Again, you would agree that that is uh, pretty fresh, or there is indicative of fresh wood splintering associated with projectiles coming through there, correct? Yes. And 307. Same, same thing, correct? Yes. Right. Ms. Junk, can you give me A260? All right, let me orange you again. You see at the top of the, of the picture there, can you see that screen door? Well, I can see the door. There's the front door, right? Right. Screen door open. Right. Wood frame right there. Right. Okay. Internal wall, and then come this way, and this appears to be some kind of light. You'll get a better look at it. Here in a second, but it seems to be attached to. Can you see the underlying plywood? Yes. Okay. Now, again, just inside that front wall, and we're talking about you look up here. We're talking about this area right in here. Right. Okay. As you look at that, do you see what appears to be? Blood spatter or some kind of castle? Well, I see a spatter pattern. I, I don't know that it's blood, but it, I see a spatter pattern. Okay. Well, you've been doing this for a long time, right? And based on your knowledge, your training, your experience in crime scenes where people are shot, is that consistent with blood cast off of blood spatter? It's consistent with blood spatter. Okay. Uh, did cast off, no, it doesn't have a linear. Uh, necessarily a linear configuration there. You could probably argue some linear characteristics. Um, could have a cast off associated with it, but again, it's consistent with blood staining, but I don't know that it is blood staining. And can you zoom in there a little bit for me on that blood? Or on that, what appears to be blood? Again, as you can look at it there, is that consistent with would you say spatter or cat? It's spatter, right? It, spatter, and it, it, there are some linear characteristics to it, so I, I can't negate a cast off creation, but okay. uh, it's, uh, it's spatter, yes. And what, what is cast off? Cast off is when an object is flung from an object in motion. Um, so, say for example, I have a bleeding finger and I flick my hand, it creates this linear mark of blood being cast away from the bleeding finger. Um, let's say that I have a liquid that I put on here and it creates that linear liquid um, pattern from it. So it could be that I just have blood on my hand and it's not actually bleeding. So I could put the liquid on here and then create something like that. That would be cast off. It's being flung from an object in motion. And Mr. John, can you give me Picture 182. Okay, let me orient you again. We're just inside that door. You can see the frame of the door in the lower left hand corner. Yep. See it? And then as you work your way away from it, you can actually see the plywood and that white sheet that you're just referring to, correct? Yes. And Mr. Jeff, can you zoom in there uh, a little bit closer for me? I want to see the frame. Again. Slide over to the left. Do you see these, what appear to be droplets uh, on the floor around that same area? Do you see those? Spatter, yes. Okay, so that's spatter. 
Yes. And what what is spatter? Well, spatter is it, 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 spatter in its basic form is is blood that is pulled away from something by some force. Uh, a drip stain, for example, where you, you just have a drop, like a raindrop. Uh, the only force acting upon that is gravity. If I add force to it in some fashion, all right, now I'm creating greater kinetic energy. So like with, with the cast off that I showed you or an impact or something where something actually contacts forcefully a blood source, it can actually create smaller spatters. And the greater the force, the greater the kinetic energy expenditure, the smaller the droplets become. And again, that's consistent. That could be consistent with a bullet passing through and blowing that, blowing that blood, correct? No, well, no. Uh, if if a bullet was creating this, I would expect much smaller droplets. Uh, these are more akin to a cast off or something like that. Okay, so back me up real quick. And again, we're talking about this area right here. And you testified about cast off on that white plywood, all right? And you talked about. Again, is that consistent with me standing in front of that doorway inside, inside the house, right here, taking a shot that is egregious to my arm and spinning? No. No? no? And I'll explain why. Especially when you're dealing with a skin wound like that arm, the first thing that has to happen, that bullet is moving between 2,700 and 3, 2,700 feet per second and 3,000 feet per second. So it's moving. When it strikes that arm, it's well gone before any bleeding actually begins. Right. Now you have to have the compromised veins or arteries, and again, I'm not seeing any artery compromise in the stains that we're seeing here. But it's not like the movies where somebody is shot and you have this, this massive blood storm that is coming out. It doesn't occur that way. So the first thing that happens is the bullet's going to go through there and then bleeding has to begin. And that may take seconds before it starts and then if it's stemmed in some fashion, it's going to take longer. And then I'm going to expect to see the blood staining more passive in nature. So the fact that I have this spatter pattern here, that tells me that something with blood on it is being moved. But it's not a bullet that is created. States. Right, I, I, that's, you misunderstood. Okay. So I, I wasn't saying a bullet created that. What I'm saying is, I'm standing in front of that door. A bullet passes through my arm, passes through my gut. I do one of these, put my head about uh, level with those wood chips, right? And then I spin like I'm going back to my room or making a run for it. That spinning motion, I had a second to start bleeding. That spinning motion could certainly produce that cast off. And I can't negate what you just demonstrated as a possibility. Right. But you would agree that there's none of that, none of that right there is out on this porch, correct? Right? No, again, it, like I said, we're talking about seconds between the time the injury occurs and bleeding could occur. So I could easily move from that position and into the location where we're seeing the blood. Through a closed door without Smudging, smearing, or anything. Through a closed door with no door handle. Okay. Without transferring any blood. Well, now we have to. I don't know how the door gets opened or who opened the door. Okay. And certainly you would agree that it was closed when the shooting started. Oh, I'd agree with that. Okay. It, it had to be closed for that one shot, yes. Okay. You would agree that this spatter and cast off that we see in these pictures in the living room is contained to the living room, correct? I agree with that. Okay. So clearly, there's no evidence that a wounded person ran and, and had cast off or spatter anywhere other than this combined space, correct? I'd agree with that. So you would certainly agree that. Chris and Gary, when, after they were shot, or when they were being shot, were right in this area, correct? Right? Um, we're talking about the 40 caliber? Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk 40 caliber. Well, 40, 40 caliber, yes. I would agree that those shots occurred there. 
But the evidence certainly supports and can't negate that the 762 by 39 was fired from outside. No, the 762, you're right. You're, you're saying the 762 was fired from outside, right? Yes. But the evidence would also support that Chris was actually hit with the 762 inside. Uh, no, I can't, I can't negate that he was outside when he was shot. You can't negate that he was inside when he was shot with it either, can you? Well, in that context, no. So you can't tell us where Chris was shot, can you? I can tell you that it, the evidence is consistent with him being outside. I can't negate that. Okay. You can also tell us that the evidence is consistent with him being inside where we saw those wood splinters and those rounds come through the door, correct? It, it, in the realm of possibilities, yes. Okay. And you would agree, again, there's no blood out on that porch. And again, I've explained why I wouldn't expect to see it. Let's talk about another one that Chris Sr. suffered. Again, you talked about cast off and uh, the blood spatter in this area right here. Are you aware, through your analysis of this case, that Chris Sr. actually took a shot to the chest as well? Yes. And that's actually a contact shot, correct? Yes. There's scorching and uh, uh, burning associated with this sweatshirt. That's Heat right. effect, yes. Heat effect, yep. So that means that that gun was in his chest when that shot happened, correct? In contact or near contact, yes. Okay. And again, you would agree, you understand that that is a 40 caliber one, correct? A 40 caliber was associated with that, that shot. Yes. And before we go any further, you would agree, again, based on your analysis of the case and the coroner's uh, information, that neither the shot to the arm nor the perforating shot to the abdomen would have, it, it didn't hit a spinal cord, it didn't sever anything that would have instantly dropped Chris where he couldn't move. Right? Hey, yeah, those two shots don't compromise the central nervous system, so he could operate. So then we have this shot to the chest, which is a contact shot. And if you could, Mr. John, can you give me a picture of 212, A212? I've put up state exhibit A212 for the jury and for you. And you see blood, again, you see the drag, or what do you call them, the swipes, or? It, it smears. Smears, but it's consistent with the drag, correct? Yes. All right. But to the right of that, there's also some spatter, some droplets as well, correct? Yes. And there's actually a little pool of blood there as well, correct? Yes. And that is consistent with uh, a body or a bleeding event being there for at least a, I won't say extended period of time, but it, with a bleeding event happening at that spot. Right. Long enough to create the volume. Correct. And you are aware that just under that recliner, the side of the room, there's a hole in the floor with some blood around it as well. Yes. Right. Now, when you gave us your draft report, again, the same draft report, the only report that you've done in this case, uh, you were unaware of who that blood belonged to, correct? Correct. Right. And I'm going to... So I'm going to show you again. Up here on the state exhibit A545, there's 18 and 19. I have 18 or 19. And again, those are samples of, of blood that were drawn. Okay. Now at this time, I'd ask permission to read one of the stipulations. This, is this a stipulation we've already had? No, we've already had it, correct. Okay. I'm going to read a stipulation that's already been entered into evidence in this case. Stipulation number seven. Swabs from the stain in the living room of 4077 Union Hill Road contained in photo ID 18 tested positive for blood. The DNA profile of the blood from this swab contains Chris Roden's DNA. 
Chris okay. Wood's team. Okay. Okay. You, that was not information that you had when you created your report, correct? Correct. And there was also a on the wall there, and you can actually see it in that picture, there was some cast off a spatter or something uh, on the wall as well, correct? But, well, but there's a spatter happening. Yeah. Spatter, right, that's what I meant. So, uh, and that was identified as item number 19, if you need to refer to where it is. All right. Again, I'm going to read Your Honor, another stipulation. This is stipulation number 8. Swabs from the stain on the wall of the living room at 4077 Union Hill Road, identified in photo item 19, tested positive for blood. The DNA profile of the blood from this swab contained Chris Roden Sr.'s DNA. Okay. You also, again, understand we talked about the hole in the floor right there. Uh, are you aware that a projectile was dug out from underneath the, the trailer that linked up to that? Thing? A 40 caliber. A 40 caliber, okay. Does that assist you with respect to knowing that that blood and the origination of that pattern right there belongs to Chris Roden? Is that helpful in your understanding of this scene? Well, certainly it tells me that Chris Roden is the, he's in this location while bleeding, and that he's likely the source of that drag, the longer of the two drag trips. And again, this is a good picture for you to use. It's your testimony that that rocking chair clearly has been moved. It, or that rocker recliner clearly was moved. It wasn't there when Chris was laying there, correct? Right? Yes. Okay. Well, again, I, mean, I don't know that the drag trail was tested, but given the information that you just gave me, uh, it's consistent with that being Chris wrote. Right. So, again, when you look at that, it's fair to say that that area right there is where Chris wrote at least fell. You know, we say all of them fell because the, the drag pattern started there, but his body was laying there and at some point was the was yes. All the way back to that bedroom, correct? It, well, yeah. It, he's dragged from there and then it stops for a period because we have more pooling correct. and accumulation and then it's dragged further. I also want to talk to you about, can you give me A178? Okay, state exhibit A178. Are you aware, again, that there was blood found on that back wall there? Yes. And at the time that you did your report, you did not have information, your track report, you do not have information with respect to who item number 20's blood was or the blood on the back wall, correct? Correct. Now I'm going to read another stipulation. This will be stipulation number nine. Swabs from the stain on the floor of the living room of 4077 Union Hill Road identified as photo ID 20, tested positive for blood. The DNA profile of the blood from this swab contains Gary Roden's DNA. I'll also read number 10. Swabs from the stain on the back of the wall, the living room area, 4077 Union Hill Road, identified as photo item number 21, tested positive for blood. The DNA profile of the blood from this swab contains Gary Roden's DNA. Again, does that help you with understanding where those bodies ultimately came to rest in that scene? You're talking about the blood staining on the wall? Well, both the wall and the floor. Does that, does that help you look, does that help you understand better where Jerry was in that room? Well, as far as the pattern on the wall, I, I mean, that could have got there any number of ways. Okay. But. As far as the floor, do, you, do we know exactly where on the floor? Um, I'm going to it, so it's right at the apex of this turn right here. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, yeah, I can say that his blood is in that area. Okay. You would also agree, as you look at that picture there, you would also agree that this drag mark right here actually is broken by what appears to be a swipe in the area of that rug. You would agree with that, correct? It, well, the drag trails are intermingled at that point, yes. Right. But you, again, would agree that clearly there's an evidence of a swipe or motion in that blood just short of where that rug is. Well, yes. I mean, the whole thing is a smear, swipe, wipe area. Uh, it's That's why I'm, I'm kind of drifting back to using the term smear. Uh, but it's still inter intermingled. Okay. Uh, I know, based on the evidence that is there, we have two blood sources. Correct. That I know that the entire blood trail was not tested, so I can't tell you, do I have a mixture here? Uh, what do I actually have? Uh, other than what you just told me about some blood sample taken from that one area uh, comes back to, to Gary, and then other blood stains in there come back to Chris. I know both of them are there somewhere, but where they intermingle in that larger pattern, I can't tell you. All right, so you're saying, you're saying that based on your analysis of the scene and the fact that that blood uh, is, is Gary Gordon's blood, that you can't make any determination with respect to where he was in that scene. Is that what you're telling us? But, yeah, other than he's got to be somewhere in that area where his blood is found there. But where his body is actually laying, I don't have any idea whose blood belongs to the larger volume stains. And I don't know, that in the fact that the two patterns coalesce at some point, I should have a mixture. And I don't know that I have that because I, I'm unaware of any testing that was done on the, the later parts of the pattern. You would agree that at least Chris starts over by that chair, right? I would agree that his blood is over there. That, again, I don't know anything if the drag trail was actually tested. You would also agree that it didn't appear that anything, no tables were knocked over, there's a hutch in the back, that wasn't knocked over. There was no indication from that scene of uh, a, a, an attempt to escape or an attempt to run out or struggle, right? I'd agree with you. In your time, and Mr. Jeff, you can, you can memorize that for now. In your time working in this field, do you know who Bill Bozziak is? William Bozziak. I do. Okay. And he is pretty much the premier expert on shoe print evidence in America, correct? If not the world. Yeah, I, he knows a lot about shoes. And he's written a bunch of books on it, and a lot of people use those books to train people, correct? They do. You are not a shoe print expert, correct? Correct. Never worked in a lab where you analyze shoe prints, correct? No. Nope. Never assigned to uh, a lab where you did trace evidence on a day-to-day -day basis, correct? Correct. And when you were a detective, you actually would, shoe print evidence you found, you actually would send that type of expert or evidence to experts for them to give you an opinion on, correct? Correct. And from time to time, when you need, when agencies need an outside opinion or confirmation, they send it to folks like Bill Bozian, correct? That's fair. If you could, go to page 27 of the report for me. You testified on direct about shoe prints in this case. And you testify that you would expect to see more shoe prints, and although there's uh, several shoe prints, they all seem to be going in the, in the same direction. Page 27 of your report, paragraph 3C, uh, number 3. Oh, excuse me. Let's get just go with C. Overlying the smear trail, two pattern transfer stains appear. The pattern transfers suggest a sole shoe creation, a shoe sole creation. <laughs> The dual pattern suggests a walking motion from the bedroom towards the living room. Observed on the tile floor next to the smear trail is a pattern transfer suggesting shoe sole transfer that differs in appearance to the previously described transfer patterns. Okay. When you did this report, you had reviewed the BCI 
uh, shoe print experts' reports, correct? Yes. And you had re you reviewed Bill Boziak's reports, correct? Yes. And you saw in both of those reports that multiple shoe prints of a Walmart brand athletic shoe were found in the seat, correct? Correct. You didn't mention that in your report, correct? No, I, I'm talking about a specific area. Here. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to put up what's been marked for identification for this Dixie Dip A547. Dixie Dip A547. With respect to shoe prints in this scene, 23, 24, 47, I believe 35. Those are all shoe prints found in this scene. And you, when you said you were talking about a specific shoe print, you ignored, in your report, you ignored the information about these other shoe prints, right? No, I was talking about a specific area. Okay. And that's, that's what I was relating to in the report was 35. 35, correct. Yes. That's the shoe print in the kitchen, correct? Yes. Right. And you, with respect to that shoe print, you said it appeared to look different than the rest of them, correct? No. It, there's actually what appears to be a lug style uh, shoe print in that area as well. You got dog prints okay. and stuff like that. And there appears to be, because I don't have any close up of it, there appears to be what looks like a lug style shoe print in that area that I don't have any close up of. Okay. So I can't go any further than that. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. But the shoe prints that are consistent with what we're seeing over here, that's what appears at 35. Correct, correct. It's got a little bit of slippage there, right? Yes. Okay. Good. It's suggesting motion. Correct, correct. But in your report, you would agree that you do not reference the fact that there are multiple left shoe prints of different size. There's a 10 and a half and 11 in that seat. I'm going on what is stated, but uh, again, I, I'm unaware that the actual shoes were tested. Okay. In this particular case. Okay. Well, that's a fine point. All right. You understand that you don't need the actual shoe to identify certain class characteristics about a shoe, correct? Class characteristics, no. Right. Now, again, the actual shoe, yes. So if I step on a piece of glass and cut the bottom of my shoe and, you, and made a print, you would want my exact shoe to say, yes, that is the exact shoe that created that print. Because you're looking for the individual characteristics. characteristics. Correct. But it is clearly accepted to, to, to make opinions based on class characteristics with respect to imprint evidence, correct? Well, sure, to an extent, to depending an extent. on what it is you're trying to say. Yep. Yeah. Such as the type of shoe. Sure. Such as the size of shoe. To an extent, sure. Okay. In this report, in your work in this case, you knew that there were two different size shoes, two different size left shoes of the same brand in that scene, but you didn't put anything in the report about it, did you? It's not why I was looking at the scene. So I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, I didn't, correct? That's your answer, right? Yeah, right. But you were looking at the scene, and one of the things you were asked to do is to determine how many people were in that scene, correct? Sure. And you ignored the fact that there were two different sized shoes with the same brand. No. You I didn't? didn't? I didn't ignore it. I, didn't. I, I Because I don't have these shoes, there's not a lot I can say about it. I don't know what the shoes look like. You don't need the shoes to say that there's two different size shoes, correct? I don't know the type of pattern that can be left behind by the shoes. So Bill. I'm limited into what I can actually say about them. Bill Bodziak, a national expert, a guy who writes the book on this, gave a report that you reviewed that said there were two different sized Walmart shoe, left shoes. And you consciously disregarded that and came up with an opinion that one person could have done this, right? No. Be because so, I because I didn't see the shoes, I can't tell you what that shoe print would look like from the shoes. I can tell you that his report says he looked at a size 11 and a size 10 and a half shoe 
that weren't these shoes. So, okay, I don't know what these shoes would look like in this particular scene. I just don't know. So you ignored it? I didn't ignore it. I, that is not, I wasn't there to look at the shoe prints. I was looking at the blood stains and what the blood stains were supporting. The blood stains on two different size left shoes. According to the Boziak report, but I don't know what these shoes would have done. Okay. And clearly you didn't testify anything about that on your direct, correct? Correct. Right. You just testified that when you moved it, look, the evidence inside, not mentioning the shoes, that yeah. well, it could have been one person. I can't negate the fact that one person could have done this, and I equally said, I can't negate multiple people. Right. I'm just saying that one person could have done the shooting. Right. But as a long-time detective, right, in a big city, certainly you would agree that it's an important clue with respect to how many people are in the crime scene if there's two different size left shoes in blood in that scene. That's it. I would agree with that. I want to go to page 30. I'm going to move on to scene two here real quick. 4199. Let's go to page 39, paragraph four of your report. Let me know when you're there. I'm here. All right. You're looking at blood stain and blood stain patterns on the bodies of Clarence Roden and Hannah Gilly. That's Frankie Roden and Hannah Gilly. Support movement of or secondary contact with the bodies. Yes. And then you say the movement pattern suggested by the blood stains and the blood stain patterns indicate some rotational positioning as well as motion contact by secondary objects such as hand or fingers. You put that in there, correct? Yes. Now you knew when you did this report that there was a baby in that bed with them all night. You knew that, right? I knew there was a baby that was there, whether it was in the bed or not, I can't tell you. I, I don't recall that off the top of my head. Okay. If there was a baby in that bed, in between the two of them, all night long, certainly that would account for some of that movement in the blood that you saw, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. the, not the, the, the motion stains that I saw, no. Uh, the, they weren't that size. They, they were larger than that. They were more consistent with a larger hand. So if I'm in bed all night trying to breastfeed, I'm a, I'm a, a little baby, and I'm swiping or, or moving, and, and I can make patterns in that blood, correct? Well, sure, but that's not what I'm seeing. And certainly you didn't report that there was a baby in there, correct? That's correct. Did you ignore it? You didn't ignore it, did you? No, I'm, I can't remember there being a baby there. I want to talk about scene four. And that recreation that you did with respect to shooting that gun. Now you would agree you never went to the area known as 799 West Fork Road, correct? Correct. And you never went onto that property and shot a gun on that property, correct? Correct. And you never asked or attempted to gain access to the trail that was removed from that property to do an experiment, correct? Uh, well, no. Okay. You know, when you teach your classes, surely you teach your students or train your students that when you're doing a recreation of something, you should try to make it as real as possible. That's something you teach, right? Sure. That's important, right? It can be. Because the less realistic that the, that the recreation is, the less reliable the result, correct? Agreed. All right. Perfect.
and any of which have been marked for identification purposes, as State's Exhibit JJJ quadruple J dash one. Mr. John, can you give me screen captures of the shooting? All right, states is in quadruple J1 that's up on the screen. Is that the location where you did this test fire? I mean, that's where you did both the day and night test fires, correct? Yes. Sir. And is that, are you from Colorado? Uh, well, I was actually born in France, but I, I've lived in Colorado most of my life. Okay, is this picture taken in Colorado? It is. Is that a ranch or a range? It clearly looks like wide open space, correct? Right? It's my son-in-law's place. Okay. And you would agree that that's outside, correct? Yes. Right. And you did both the day and the night recreation outside, correct? Well, they were technically they were all night once at dusk. Okay. The sun had just cleared the horizon, and the rest of them are after the sun is woke up. Oh, I'm sorry. You would agree also that that shot fired inside Kenneth Roden property's property was shot inside the trailer, right? Agreed. And you would agree that although in your recreation it was dark and you used a Glock with similar ammunition, that was about the, the extent of the, the similarities, correct? Yep. Right. Let's talk about light. I'm going to hand you what's been marked. That states is a quadruple J2. Quadruple J2, if you take a look at that, that you guys nice PowerPoint. Again, if you look at the top of that, there is a file name that ends in 8936. And again, if you look at the bottom, you see that there's a bar where it's, uh, it's been playing. You would agree that that's a screen capture of one of your videos, right? Yes. And even though it was outside in wide open spaces, clearly the gun still made a flash, correct? In most, but not every shot, yes. You would agree that light works off of like wavelength frequency. That's how <coughs> light works, correct? Yes. And the way we see light is it reflects off objects and our eyes pick up that those wavelengths. That's how that works, correct? Correct. And clearly, inside of a room, there are more objects for light to bounce off of. Floors, ceilings, beds. Some, some of the objects will absorb light, others will reflect. You would agree with that, correct? Yes. And you would agree that, again, in some situations, light can actually be amplified by reflection, by the angle that your eye sees. <coughs> Well, even reflective surfaces have some absorbent qualities to them, so to increase it, I don't know that I would agree with that, but... You would agree with, uh, again, you live in Colorado, you guys get snow, right? Yes. Sunny days, you walk outside your house, and even though you're not looking directly at the sun, it can almost be overwhelming sometimes with the amount of light reflecting snow back blind. off the snow. And that's a good example of how light reflects off surfaces, correct? Sure. And again, light can reflect off of those same surfaces inside a room, correct? Sure. Outside, in the wide open space, there's nothing to reflect that light back the same way there is in the room, right? Sure. All right. Had you actually done that experiment inside a room, you would be better able to tell us about how the reflection of walls, floors, whatever, actually amplified, not amplified, but actually reflected that light so you can see it, correct? Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, yes.
Sorry. All right, Mr. Priest. A few more questions for you. You testified about the number of people on the scene and talked at nauseam really about the number of shoe friends in Mr. Bozziak's report. Um, again, another, another clue or piece of evidence that's important a lot of times with respect to how many people are involved in shooting is the number of weapons involved in shooting, correct? Can be. Can be. And that's something that clearly, as a detective, you would take into consideration, correct? Sure. You talked about, under direct examination, in your report, actually, you talked about the covering up of victims. Do you remember testifying that? Yes. Putting a blanket on them or, or pillows over their head. You, uh, and basically that goes to, like, offender behavior. You talk about depersonalization of a victim. That's something that an offender may do to depersonalize or, or hide uh, a victim, correct? That's right. All right. There are also, in your career as a law enforcement officer uh, and a detective, there are also other behaviors that are indicative of criminal behavior, correct? Other, other activities. There's lots. Mm -hmm. And you would agree that creating Mementos or trophies is something that sometimes you see with respect to an offender in murder case. More along the lines of serial offenders or repeat offenders, you start seeing trophy gathering, but you can't see it in single offenses. Okay. And it, again, part of it is uh, it, it allows the, the offender to, to kind of recreate or, or there's, there's something associated with uh, it's pride or something associated with uh, that killing, right? Well, sometimes to relive the event, okay. and sometimes it's just because they want the object. Correct. And again, you see, again, you'll, you'll see hiding evidence in a location that's familiar to you so you can go back by it and, and relive it or, or be close to the evidence. Could be victim clothing, could be weapons, could be anything like that, correct? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes. The State's Exhibit D201. State's Exhibit D201. Can you look at that first? Yes. So, can you tell us what that is? Well, it's a photograph of. Um, um, I just lost his name. Kenneth. Uh, showing a, what appears to be a gunshot wound of his uh, right eye, and associated with some blood stain. Yeah, I'm going to publish this. Screen? Yes. Uh, George Wagner. And that appears to be uh, a wolf or some kind of canine with uh, at least damage or some kind of defect uh, on the right eye, correct? I don't know what it is, but it's there's obviously some sort of object on the eye. I mean, this appears to be a drawing, but okay. I, I don't know. I, I mean, you're describing it as damage or injury. Something I don't know what it is. It's, something that looks different than... It is not normal, right? There's, there's something that's clearly observable in that eye, correct? Well, yeah, it's different from the left eye. Okay. And, again, that's the right eye, correct? Correct. Right. Surely in your career as a law enforcement officer, you are familiar with offenders who use tattoos to, I won't say boast, but, but again, memorialize or create a memento for a homicide. They can. And again, 
tattoos, think about prison tattoos, teardrop tattoos, not prison tattoos, teardrop tattoos, uh, other type tattoos where offenders again almost brag about what they've done, correct? They can. And are you also familiar with offenders who will notch or decorate uh, weapons that indicate shootings or, or homicides they have? They can. Okay. I'm show you what's been marked for identification purposes. The state's exhibit double D six one six. Can you describe to the jury what that is? Well, it's a Beretta firearm. Looks like nine millimeter caliber. Um, there's no magazine in the magazine well, and the there's no round in the chamber, and the slide is locked back, and it has a pair of some sort of white composite grip with um, graphics on them. Okay. And specifically, those graphics are the Grim Reaper, correct? Right, you get a Grim Reaper on one side, and what looks like I guess it could be the Grim Reaper on the other side, but, but they're different. Right, right. Different, different views of the same Grim Reaper, correct? Or of the Grim Reaper, correct? Well, one is a skull with a guy that looks like he's wearing a hoodie, could be the Grim Reaper. The other one, clearly, because of the sickle, uh, would be consistent with the Grim Reaper. I'm a handy with the marker identification purpose, states exhibit double D 618. Again, you describe that. Sure. Again, we have a uh, Beretta firearm. Here's to be 9mm caliber, the chamber is empty, there's no magazine in the magazine well, and the slide is locked back. Um, similar grips. Again, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience in this area, does the Grim Reaper symbolize death? Can. How long have you known that you were going to come and testify in this case? Uh, say that again? How long have you known that you were going to come and testify in this case? Mm, about 10 days. And even though it's an eight victim homicide case, you've only prepared a draft report? When I submitted the draft report and typically I have back and forth with the attorneys that didn't occur. You never came to walk through any of these scenes, did you? No. Never came to view any of this evidence actually in person, did you? No. Never looked at the trailers involved in the scene, did you? Correct. Right. Even though you knew that there was a Ferris scan done in this case, you never actually requested the raw Ferris scan data that would have given us measurements of every scene, correct? Well, the raw ferro scan data doesn't tell me anything without the ferro reconstruction program. I needed to look at the rendered data, which was sent to me. Okay. But you didn't look at either of those, right? I looked at the rendered data. Okay. And did you, were you able to make the measurements uh, that you needed to using the ferro scan? I was able to, to assess some of the measurements. You never met with BCI, any of the agents, any of the crime scene agents to get better context of what they did in this case, did you? No. And with some exceptions, you haven't been able to recall the names of the victims. That's not unusual for me. I forget names moments after hearing. Mr. Priest, you were prepared, excuse me, you were given the information with respect to this case in January of 2022, correct? That sounds accurate. And you actually prepared your report for this case in June of 22. Correct.
Showing some pictures there at 477 uh, regarding some smears, and you were asked questions about those trails in the body. Do you remember those questions? Yes. If a body is dragged, does that give you any indication as to how many people are present versus being carried? Uh, drag, uh, one person can drag a body. Okay. But if it's being carried, it suggests additional individuals, more than one. Right. And so, based on the photos that we have here on the floor of the smear trails, that's an indication of a drag or a carry. Drag. And if we have, if, if you have more than one person and they want to move a body, uh, what would you expect to see? Well, and certainly you could have a drag, but. It's just unusual. Why, why not carry it? I okay. mean, with two people. All right. You were also asked about print. I'm not going to get into your analysis of print. You're not a shoe print expert, right? That's correct. However, in the photos that you saw, well, the area, the, the space in which that blood smear went by the treadmill and the tape, do you remember that area? Yes. Did you see a right print anywhere through there for a right shoe? No. Okay. Find a right shoe at all in that area, whether yeah. in the living room or anywhere else. That's correct. Okay. And if there were more than one person in that confined area, what is your opinion as to the likelihood of there being additional prints or crossover prints in blood? Well, given the amount of blood that's on the floor, I would expect the likelihood of interaction to be greater. So I would certainly look for multiple prints and overlay type of prints, but I guess they could have been very clean. Now, if we could see quadruple J2. This is a photo that you testified about in your cross-examination. Can you identify what that photo is? It's muzzle flash. All right. And so it appears to be an orangish red light there. What is that? Uh, that's basically the burning powder that, that's coming out of the end of the barrel. And so for reference, to determine how big that flash is, what is that bright yellow thing on the left? Uh, that's the act. That's the muzzle itself. That's the burning that's inside the barrel. Okay. And so this is what size caliber firearm? 40 caliber, so about half an inch. Okay. So for reference, that fire, that burst of fire is, I don't know if you could determine the, the size of that next to that 40 caliber muzzle. That's 0 0.40 of an inch, so it's not quite half an inch. Okay. All right. I don't have the pictures here of that, that camper, but hypothetically, if the door was closed and the blinds are closed, are you going to see a flash of that size if you're standing outside? Well, I wouldn't expect to see a flash, muzzle flash from firearms at all, based on my experience, but uh, certainly something that small, uh, not likely. Okay. 
You were asked about mementos, too, of murder. Now, let me ask, what's a, what, again, what size firearm and caliber size is that in that photo? That's a 40 caliber. That's a 40 caliber? And what was the brand? Uh, Glock. All right, Jim, so you were shown this firearm. What is that? That's a Beretta. And the, the size caliber? 9 millimeter. And in your review of the case notes, was this gun used at all in any of the murders? A Beretta 9 millimeter? I have no indication that firearm or a like firearm was used. There may be, tell me if there's different versions of tunnel vision, but you testified about what tunnel vision is, right? Yes. Now, you were a detective for the Denver Police Department for how long? You know, well, I was a detective for about um, 29 years, 27 of which I spent doing death investigations. Okay. Now, as far as the government goes and the prosecution of the case, is it common or is it a problem to get tunnel vision in regard to a theory of a case? Well, I guess it depends on the level of stress that's associated with that. Right, so if you have a theory on how something occurred, is it possible that you could have a tunnel vision as to who your suspect or how things happened? Uh, well, no, I mean, I'd need more information than that. Okay. Thank you. One of the ways you ensure that you're getting to the right suspect is you rule out other suspects, right? That's a, that's a common practice. Yes. Yeah. And then once you get to where you can't rule people out, then you look at the evidence and rule people in. That's how you do it, right? Well, what will the evidence support? Correct. Correct. And again, you look at things like ballistic evidence. You look at things like shoe print evidence. That's the type of forensic evidence that you look at in trying to determine who may be involved in, in a case or how many people may be involved in a case. Yeah, the who usually goes to something that is going to give me the who. DNA, for example, fingerprints, for example. That's going to give me who. Um, other things may give me suggestions. Right, right. And that's circumstantial evidence, right? Yes. And then, you can't tell us how many people are involved in these homicides. No, but when asked, could one person have done all this? Sure. But I can't say multiple people did not. Right. And I think you've already admitted that you've ignored other relevant didn't take into account of the relevant evidence with respect to shoe prints in the scene. No, that's not true. I, I simply said that the evidence necessary for me to give it more weight wasn't there.
do not do any research at all concerning the case, either as to the facts or as to the law from any source at all. Do not read, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all. And have no contact with uh, any of the participants in the case, including parties, counsel, or witnesses. Um, at 1.30, please assemble at the jury room and be brought back up here uh, by uh, court personnel. Um, again, anything for the counsel for yourself? Thank you. All right, with that, we are in recess until 1.30.
Let me ask, we're uh, going back to the state side of the case again, correct? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. And we'll be playing some uh, recordings, correct. correct, with the, uh, with the uh, transcripts. Correct. And uh, does, uh, at the end of this day, uh, and will the, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about scheduling. Do you anticipate the jury coming back on Monday or? I believe we had said the jury would come back on Tuesday, Your Honor, because do you intend to rest after this witness, subject to the admission of our exhibit? And so I thought we were going to take Monday to do admission of exhibit and Rule 29, obviously, outside of the presence of the jury. So I believe that we were going to instruct them to come back Tuesday morning. You anticipate getting through the rest of the tapes? I, we do, yes. And I think then the only other question is, I mean, to me, they have other people, other witnesses, correct? We do. Um, so it would be they would be returning on Tuesday for right. the defense to resume its case. Right. So that's what we'll do at the end of the day. Um, is counsel for both sides ready to have the jury? I just need to check these TVs real quick. Since we're going back to PowerPoint, I want to make sure. See, that's not what's on the screen right now. So I'd rather do that. Do it right, 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 do it right now. And I have a, a copy for the court on a new and improved system for you. You'd ask me to do all of it, and so you can get a transcript for that call. Is this one we've already listened to or not? No. No. Yeah, okay. It's coming up. It'll be the first call for today. Okay. Five oh two last one we listened to. That is the last one we listened to, Your Honor. So we're ready now, Mr. Yes. yes.
Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury, we are, uh, we have heard a defense witness, as you're aware, just before we recess for lunch recess. Now we are going to uh, begin again hearing uh, state's evidence. Uh, we're going to resume uh, with the uh, uh, playing of additional recordings, and we'll be given transcripts as you were uh, yesterday. I just remind you that these transcripts are being provided to you as listening aids only. They're being provided to you to assist you in understanding the audio recording that the audio recording is being played. The listening aid, that is, the transcripts are not evidence. They're not intended to replace or overrule uh, your understanding of what you hear on the audio recordings. The audio recordings themselves uh, are the evidence. The listening aids, and again, that's the transcript I'm talking about there, are to be used only as listening aids and are not a substitution for the content uh, of the audio recordings. And, and these listening aids will be gathered up after each uh, recording, and, and you will not have these uh, transcripts or listening aids with you in the jury room. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Is the defense? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. We have uh, we need to call a witness on this, uh, Miss Everslade. Since we had a break between your testimony of yesterday and today, I'm going to ask you. Solomon swear or affirm that the testimony you were about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall have to And the state may continue the examination. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, go ahead and state your name again for the record. Julia Eveslage. Okay. And Ms. Eveslage, um, when we um, we're here yesterday. We had just concluded a phone call, um, which was marked quadruple I 23A, and I believe the call number was 502. Um, showing you now on the screen what has been marked as quadruple I 24. Can you tell us what we are looking at there? This is call number 1505 from this particular line. It's a recording from the device that was named TSA, found in the front passenger portion of the truck. It's dated July 5th, 2018 at 1837, and the context notes read, Jake and George Wagner discuss Beth and the kids' safety. And could we please play quadruple I 24A? <clears throat> Thank you. 
because I found an accurate copy of the um, portion of the consultation in call number 1505 that you prepared for us today. the mark of quadruple I-25. This is call number 7671 from this particular line. It's dated July 13th, 2018 at 949. It's an outgoing call from Angela Wagner to her mother, Rita Newcomb. <coughs> the context notes read, Angela Wagner and Rita Newcomb discuss legal representation and providing a handwriting sample. Yeah. 
that was his, that worked. They got some kind of fairground that it's like a little story, like the fox jump, what you say, the jump, fox jump over the fence or something like that. Yeah. It's a paragraph or a story like that, and they'll have you write the whole paragraph. Because supposedly they made the paragraph fit, like, you know, certain letters and stuff that they look for for identification. Yeah. And they'll have you write the whole paragraph. And then well, they'll I have. I don't know how. I'm, I just know how to write this. I'll just do the best I can, but I can't. Yeah, well, that's fine. That's, that's fine. I'll, I'll just talk about it when I get over there. But um, anyway, uh, so anyway, I'm um, going to have an attorney with her because I don't want you going in there. Um, you know, because here's the thing they said, unless they arrest you or something. Yeah. You can't even ask for an attorney. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, so I'm doing, I'm getting two attorneys to do with it. So I'll call this McHenry, I can't remember his name, I'll call this McHenry guy yeah. and see what M-C-H-E-N-R-Y. he says. All right, I'll get, all right, I'll give him a call. It should be in the phone book. Okay, I'll give him a call. Okay. All right, love you. the best place, is that actually um, a fair and accurate copy of the entire conversation in call number 76? Yes. This is phone number 17306 on this particular line. It's dated July 15th, 2018 at 1408. It's an outgoing call from George Wagner to Angela Wagner, and the context notes read, George and Angela Wagner talk about Newcomb family members.
But she now realized that, that the girl had said the same thing, that he did say that if she didn't understand something or something like that, she can tell them that she needs to confer with her attorney. And they have to give her a recess, and they have to let her come out in the hallway, and they have to let her talk to um, her attorney. All of you guys, that's all you Let me see the kids lunch and then I, because I don't want to hear them whining and complaining about what to do up there. 
I'll take care of it. Love you. Love you. Bye. And this escalation, that actually the entire call in uh, call number 17306. Yes. This is call number 344 on this particular line. It's stated July 20th, 2018 at 1421. It's an outgoing call from George Wagner to Angela Wagner. And the context notes read, George and Angela Wagner discuss legal representation. Because he needs to talk to you. He needs to talk to you guys with your dad. Your dad talked to him a little bit today, and he is just going to go over a bunch of stuff and tell you the best decisions on what to do and stuff and try and see which one needs more help. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you this. I'm sorry. Whoever the best attorney is is going to be yours. Whoever the one is going to win is going to be yours. Hmm. Does Jake take that too? I'm sorry, so I don't care if the only one who managed to take care of the kids by the self basis of most of these people. The rest of us are screw ourselves. Well, it doesn't matter. You need to go up and talk to him. He's got to talk to him. I'm going to talk to him, but I'm sorry. If everyone's going to be the best attorney in this world, and this second, it's going to be a poor attorney. I don't care what my grandmother said, it's going to be poor. Well, that's what she said. I'm sorry. I'll go in there and I'll do it without them if I have to. I don't care. No, but I'm saying that's, that's what she said. What is it? I said that's what she said. That's also what your dad said. Well, I'll do it all right with it. The best of all, it's going to take you 100% to get somebody out of there. It's going to be one of those three. Well, George, honey, turn it up. Just watch what you're doing. Everything, you know, will be okay. All right. Well, I'll be careful. Once again, Ms. Evans-Lage, is, um, is that a fair and accurate copy of the phone conversation that occurred between George and the Wagner represented in call number 344? Yes. Now it's been marked as quadruple I-28. If you can look at this and tell us what we're looking at. Please. This one is call number 793 on this particular line. It's dated July 20th, 2018, 1918. It's an outgoing call from Jake Wagner to Angela Wagner. And the context notes read, Angela Wagner gives advice from an attorney to Jake.
This is um, what's marked as call number 1366. Um, it's dated July 28, 2018, at, um, 12 minutes after midnight. An outgoing text from George Wagner to Jashana Smith Schmidt. Um, the context notes read George Wagner sends a text about his family. Okay. And do you know uh, what they sometimes call Jashana? Marcus 
text message reads, and are you okay with the fact that I am really close with my family? I know it's weird for most people, but family is all we really have in life. This is call number 2673 on this particular line. It's a recording from the device named TSA, which was found in the front passenger part of the truck. It's dated August 8th, 2018 at 1322. And the context notes read, George and Jake Wagner talk about a winter soldier face mask. This is call number 3309. It's dated August 11th, 2018, five minutes after midnight. It's an incoming call to George Wagner from Angela Wagner, and the context notes read, George Wagner talks about a bug detector.
This is call number 5923. It's dated August 13, 2018 at 1201. It's an incoming call to Jake Wagner from Billy Wagner. And the contact notes read, Billy Wagner asks Jake about a picture. Thank you. 
Marcus Quadruple I-34. This is the status and tellings of the arrest. This is call number 3541. It's dated August 13th, 2018 at 1248. It's an incoming call to Angela Wagner from Billy Wagner. And the context notes read, discussion of something Angela Wagner sent to Billy Wagner. Okay. And this is the same date that that call was made. Yes.
March 16th of 2016 um, with Georgia's credit card. Did we, are you aware of whether or not that was ever recovered um, by DCI? Yes. Yeah.
guess, first of all, I should. approach with, it, with what has been marked as quadruple F and uh, F as in French. Um, first of all, can you tell me what that is? This is a timeline of purchases that I created um, for my prior testimony. Um, there has been an addition to accommodate um, what was presented in um, forensic accountant's testimony to combine uh, a couple purchases that were left out of the first version and now have been added to the second one. Okay. So, and who is the forensic accountant's name? Um, Michael Kazar. Okay. And so you combine some of the purchases that he found when he conducted his search of financial records with the timeline that you had already prepared. For, yes. Correct? Okay. And did you also make a change to a date? Yes, there was a there was a date error um, on our original investigative timeline um, from the receipt for the Walmart DVR purchase. Um, it was it was just the um, day of the month that was incorrect on our original timeline, so that has been adjusted to accommodate the actual date. Okay, and um, referring your attention to the Winter Soldier mask that was purchased on April 9th of two thousand sixteen. Um, are you aware as to whether or not that particular mask was recovered at State Route 41 on, in 2017 on the date that uh, you were present for that search? It was not. Okay. And were there other masks that were collected that day? Yes, there were ski masks that were collected um, from the trailers or the trucks. Okay. And was there any other clothing that was collected on that day? There was, I believe, a ghillie suit that was collected. Okay. And are you aware as to what items um, you were looking for on that day? Certainly. Uh, certainly we were looking for clothing that may have been worn um, during the murders, like accessories like masks or any kind of, you know, accessories like that. Um, that's not an exhaustive list, but those were certainly items that we would have been looking for, tactical items as well. Okay. And were you also aware as to whether or not um, George owned a motorcycle in April of 2016? I was not. Did you also obtain um, documentation of various um, insurance claims related to the um, instances of arson and also uh, wreck that uh, of George's truck? Yes. I'm going to approach you and hand you what's been marked individually as state's exhibit quadruple E1 and through quadruple E4. If you could just go through each of those and tell us what they are. Quadruple E1 is a, um, these are information or reports that I obtained through access with a commercial database that I, uh, myself and other analysts in my unit have access to. Um, it's used by both insurance professionals and law enforcement among other, other agencies. Um, and it basically is a, um, a database that you can search for instances of insurance fraud or other types of um, similar investigations or um, potential crimes, things like that. 
So these were four reports that um, I pulled from that database with um, various levels of information, including um, dates and times of a loss uh, and the location, the parties involved, uh, and then if a potential payout uh, from the insurance companies would be found on here as well. Um, sometimes you don't find them all, but if there is a, a payment or a payout from the insurance company, you would often find that here. So uh, quadruple E1 is a property claim from uh, October 10th, 2007. It's listed as a fire to the garage at 845 Bethel Hill Road. Mm -hmm. The uh, amount that was paid was $30,000 and $30,064. And the involved parties are listed as George Wagner, 845 Bethel Hill Road. And um, it is, the ending is Billy's social security number, um, but it's listed as George Wagner and um, at 845 Bethel Hill Road. Uh, quadruple E2 is a property claim from September 14th, 2009. It's a commercial automobile policy claim, and um, it was listed as a loss description of fire. Um, the insured driver says um, George W. Wagner with the date of birth in 1971, Billy Wagner, um, and the settlement amount was $15,627, $15, and the 1992 Peterbilt truck that's listed was listed as totaled. Quadruple E3 is a property claim listed also as commercial automobile policy. It's dated uh, January 7th, 2016, and the involved party is George W. Wagner, again with Billy Wagner's um, matching social security number, and it, the vehicle information is a 2001 Kenworth truck there was um, not any information about a payout included on this one. And then quadruple E4 is a claim, a property claim um, from September 26, 2016, uh, listed as a personal automobile policy. The claimant is listed as uh, George W. Wagner with a date of birth and social security number matching Mr. Wagner. Um, it is a vehicle information is the 2007 Chevrolet Silverado. It's listed as totaled. And um, the, there is a passenger listed on here as uh, Christopher Newcomb, and uh, as well as a, attorney information, uh, as well as a claimant driver, Edward Wagner, Jake Wagner, and it's listed as having injuries as well. Okay, and when you said was that um, the the first piece of information you said that was George W. Wagner, what title did you give that? What what is he listed as? Uh, the it says both claimant and insured. Okay. And when you said it is Mr. Wagner, who do you mean? Uh, George Wagner the fourth. Okay. And was there payoff information on that? It says received value. I can't confirm that that was the amount that they received, but it's listed as $3,150. And again, this is just a database that if there's, um, if there are suspicions that it, there's fraud, then it's reported to that database, correct? Yes, I don't know all of the specific reasons that um, item reports would be found in there, but that's certainly one of them, um, okay. instances of alleged insurance fraud. Approaching you with, with what has been marked as quadruple G. Um, if you could look at that, it's two pages fastened together. Quadruple G. And do you recognize that? I do. What do you recognize that as? It's a profile picture found on George Wagner's Facebook profile. Um, it's of a wolf with some kind of scratch over its eye. And there, the second page is the comments that were found on the profile picture. The first one.
Give me cross examine. Just a few questions. Um, over the last few days, a couple days, you've gone over various, for the most part, excerpts of uh, recordings that you have prepared uh, for this case. Is that right? Yes. All right. And for example, uh, and if I say anything wrong, please say so. And you may not remember the exact recording, so I have the transcript to refresh your memory if you need it. But for example, um, Triple I, states is in Triple I 29, was just played for the jury. And that was a conversation between George and Angela, if I remember, correct? Yes. About a little farm somewhere. I think that's how it starts out, right? A little farm somewhere in the West. Right, exactly. And how long approximately was that excerpt? It looks like the excerpt here begins at 24.01 in the recording and ends at 25 minutes, so just under a minute. Right. And how long is the entire recording? Uh, one hour and three minutes, 34 seconds. And there were several other short snippets of recordings uh, that were very similar as far as the length of what you played and the length of the actual conversation. Is that fair to say? There were some. Uh, in terms of the truck recordings, um, that was just the kind of, um, that was the way that we did it with the truck. Um, there were long periods of time where they were driving, there was no conversation, and so um, it, it wasn't really feasible for the monitors to just call and call and call and call. So we, they were instructed to record a longer period of time to listen and then minimize if there was no conversation um, or just road noise, things like that. So for the truck calls with respect to those short snippets or what you're calling snippets or excerpts, um, that would be an explanation for the truck calls. That they, Those were oftentimes very long and just that was just the way that it was organized and conducted. Okay, and I'm glad you brought up the truck calls because I want to make sure we understand how that worked. Um, the listening devices that were placed into the truck were accessed by a phone call from the wire room, I think it's called, is that right? Yes. So those listening devices were not on 24-7, is that correct? Correct, they could be accessed if needed 24-7, but we were not listening or they were not always recording. So there's a lot of conversations that take place that were never recorded. I can't say for certain that there was, there was conversation outside of what we recorded, but I would expect that there was conversation that we didn't record. Well, let me ask you this. Um, 24 hours in a day, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And so how often would you call, say, on average in a 24-hour day to a truck? I, I can't say that number. I wasn't a truck monitor. Um, I right, was, so you're testifying about what other people monitored. I mean, I myself was participating in the monitoring. I wasn't actually physically calling all of the times on the truck monitors. But I, I mean, they tried to call regularly if there was conversation, but there wasn't a set like you call every five minutes or every two minutes or there wasn't. There wasn't any kind of any kind of schedule like that. Right. So naturally, you're not going to capture everything that's said in the truck. It's possible, but I, I can't say for certain. Well, would you admit that you don't have everything that was said in the truck? I would assume that that was true, but I can't. Uh, you can't say that. I can't say for sure that we didn't capture everything. Okay. You think you got everything? I mean, I wouldn't expect that we did, but right. I don't know that. I wasn't there. You weren't there, right? And so. Just to be clear, those listening devices are only activated when you, when you or one of your colleagues in the wire room called in. Yes. They were not on other lines. Correct. They were not recording other lines. Yes, only when the phone call made a call to that device. Okay. You're certainly aware that Jake has testified under oath that all the clothing that was used in the murders was burned. Uh, You're aware of that. I did not, I didn't watch the proceedings. I wasn't allowed to as a witness, so I'm not aware of things that he specifically said in his testimony here. Are you aware of his proffer that he made last year where he said the same okay. thing, that okay. all the clothing was burned okay. that was used to murder? Objection. Yeah. Well, I, the question they was. Have to
Judge, I would ask the court reporter to read back on that question. Well, I think the question was actually interrupted by an objection. Part of the question may have been objectionable, so maybe it would be better if you re-asked the question. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Are you familiar with what Jake said about the clothing that was used in the murders? You'd have to be more specific about the statements. Are you familiar? I'm sorry, what do you mean? Are you referring to his testimony? Are you referring to statements made prior to this trial? I don't know what time frame you're talking about. During the course of this investigation and the trial, are you aware of Jake's statements concerning the clothing used in the murders? Yes. And what was that? Items, what could be burned, were burned following the murders. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I have no further questions. A redirect. I think we covered this previously again, but you are specifically instructed not to record conversations that occur either on the phone or in the truck that are not relevant to the homicides, correct? Correct. Okay. So certainly you didn't record every conversation that occurred? Correct. And oftentimes when the calls are minimized, they're not recorded, right? Yes. And I think you testified previously, they spot check those where it's not relevant, so we stop listening, and then you call back in to see if it's become relevant. If it has, you listen. If it hasn't, you don't listen, right? Yes, and if there were periods of time to which the monitor couldn't understand the conversation, they continued listening. But again, if there were long periods, if there were long periods of no audible conversation or just road noise or beeping or things like that, there were certainly instances of that, but they were driving across the country in a truck. Okay. And what was your understanding of their sleep-drive arrangement? That Jake would drive during the day and George would drive at night. Okay. So were there periods of time where one would be asleep while the other was driving? Yes. Okay. Obviously there were times when they were both awake while one was driving. Yes. Okay. And not only were you only allowed to listen to calls that were relevant, but also for terms of playing anything for us today, it had to be pertinent or relevant. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh. I have nothing else, Your Honor. Any further questions? Just one or two questions. You determined what was relevant to the prosecution, correct? I wouldn't say me. I mean, at the time of the interceptions, things were deemed relevant or pertinent. Yes. Certainly when the time came for the closing arguments, we were prepping for trial. There was comment made about whether there was any evidence that was relevant. And so when we were making the closing arguments, we were prepping for trial. So there was a conversation from a team of us. It wasn't just me. Right. I understand that. But it was relevant as you determined to convicting George. As part of the state? As part of the state. It's relevant to me. Any further questions? Yes. All of these calls were provided to the defense, correct? Yes. And you yourself helped prepare transcripts of these calls to provide to the defense over a year ago. Yes. Any further questions? No. Thank you very much. All right. You may sit down. Is there going to be something further today? Yes. No, Your Honor. We have nothing further today. All right. And at this point, we have no further witnesses in the case that is our intent to move to admit our exhibits. And after that is our intent to address the case. And obviously that's going to take some time. We'll move to the exhibits and those things. But we want to let the court know what our intent is. As far as going through the exhibits and so forth and so on, and 
there are several of those. Uh, tomorrow is uh, a uh, holiday on the uh, county's calendar, at least, and I think elsewhere, uh, at which, uh, on which day the courthouse is closed. Now, was it council's desire to go through these exhibits on uh, uh, Monday? Judge, I think uh, council has had a discussion. And we do believe it will take the better part of Monday uh, to go through the legal requirements. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, tomorrow is the day when the courthouse is closed. So it will be a day off for the jury. Uh, Monday is a, is a uh, pr uh, procedure, really, that doesn't involve the jury and will take most of the day. And so Monday will be uh, a day the jury will not be back either. So you're going to have, you'll have an extended period of time. You will be coming back Tuesday uh, at 9 o'clock. So you have this relatively long break. Uh, it's very important that you follow the admonition of the court during this entire period of time. So you're back here, seated in the jury box on, on Tuesday. You're not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. You're not to permit anyone to discuss this case with you or in your presence. You're not to form or express an opinion concerning this case until it is finally submitted to you for deliberation and verdict. You are uh, to do no research of any kind concerning this case from any source uh, whatsoever. Uh, you are not, a, and that's either as to the facts or as to the law, you're not to read, listen to, review any reports or accounts of this case from any source at all. And again, I go over these things, I'm sure most of you could probably repeat them back to me, but that would include television, radio, uh, radio or newspapers, but would also include uh, Facebook, the other, other social networking media, uh, or any of the internet uh, sources to, to uh, have, uh, do none of that reading, listening to, or viewing any, from any source at all. And you're, of course, to have no contact with participants in the case, including parties, counsel, or uh, witnesses. Uh, now, Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, you're to assemble at the jury room. You'll be brought up here by uh, by officers of the court. Does counsel for either side have anything further you wish to put on the record until we recess until uh, Tuesday? Would that be the 15th, I believe? We have a calendar there. To, yeah, Tuesday the 15th uh, of November at 9 o'clock a.m. Does counsel for either party have anything else you wish to put on the record? Yeah, thank you. So we are in recess until Tuesday, November 15th at 9 o'clock.